Okay, well, I have 901 on my end, so we'll go ahead and get started with introduction comments, and we'll just kind of go through there the way we did the meeting yesterday. Alan and I held all questions until the last 20 to 25 minutes, and that seemed to work out pretty good. So I guess we'll just go ahead and uh, go through kind of a three-part presentation today. My name is Jim Jansen. We also have Alan Benelik joining us, and Ryan Evans is our media specialist. I'll make a few comments, let Alan introduce himself, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Today's theme of our meeting is building farm and ranch resiliency in the age of financial uncertainty. It's part of our annual land management outreach series that focuses on different issues related to land values, cash rental rates, and things related to those two topics, uh, succession, lease arrangements, carbon credits, uh, flex leases. That's the topic that we'll be covering today. I just wanted to point out a couple things. One thing, uh, if you're joining us today, we had uh, Mary Jarvie at the Concord Research Site with UNL. She hopefully was able to mail you out a copy of today's handouts to everyone that was joining us today, if you registered soon enough. Um, as part of mailing that out, in addition to the postage um, and the printing, those things all cost time and money. And uh, the North Central Extension Risk Management Education Center was able to help co uh, us cover some of those costs. And the other thing is, given the extensive mailing, we had around 350 people for two days register for this meeting. Uh, Nick Smith with People's Company, it's a brokerage and comic plan management company. They also helped sponsor, uh, cover some of the costs. It cost about nine bucks a handout to send them out this year which was great. We had a great, good number of people, but it was a little bit more than we had anticipated. So be sure I'll, I'll have Nick's contact information at the end of the slides if anyone has questions, but uh, we greatly appreciate everyone for joining us today. And uh, we'll just go ahead and get started. And uh, Alan, would you like to make some comments? Yeah, so the way this will work out is we'll, we'll kind of have this broke up in three segments and between each segment, we'll take a couple, three minute break. So first, Jim will talk about the a little bit about land values, a bunch about cash rental rates and flex lease arrangements and some other some other uh, observations about what's happening in Nebraska with the real estate market and the cash lease market and, or the leasing market. Uh, we'll take a quick break after he gets done making comments. I'll come back and talk about um, farm succession planning, a little bit about communication and a lot about uh, how to set up lease arrangements, especially crop share lease arrangements. So I understand that, you know, if we're talking about a Western Nebraska focus, uh, the panhandle crop, crop share is king. So we want to talk about that a fair amount. And then after another quick break, Jim will come back and finish up with just a couple slides on USDA programs that help with land management. And uh, then we'll take questions. So you can type your questions in either the chat or the Q&A. We'll get to them from either spot. So please type them in as the program goes on. You, can, you don't have to wait till the end to type them in. You can type them in whenever you have the question. We'll get to them all at the end of the program. So with that, we'll let Jim get started. You're muted, Jim. All right, and I'll mute you, Al. Okay, you're, you're muted, okay. So we have a three-part presentation today. Our first section will be on the current state of cash rental rates. Obviously, a lot of people, regardless if you're a crop producer, livestock producer, or anything in between that, a lot of people are interested on that topic. So we'll be taking a look at that. Uh, we kind of tried to focus this meeting on the Western two thirds of Nebraska, which yes, it has a lot of cropland, but also the presence of crop shares is a very uh, active thing that's in that part of the state in addition to the east. And then the final part, we'll have a look at kind of current USDA FSA programs related to land management, things that people need to be aware of. And you'll see in your handout, there's actually a fourth presentation, but due to the lack of time, we were trying to put this into a format that is uh, keep people on listening today. And uh, we're trying to put this in a format that people will hopefully really uh, find uh, an appropriate length of time. So the fourth presentation, there's actually a, a link on that set of slides. If you'd like to learn more about USDA blending programs, they have a high quality video clip USDA put together for us. You can actually go out and watch that. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. In your handouts today, if you have them in front of you, if you'd like to follow along, great. If not, don't worry about it. The thing I'll point out, you'll see in your handouts, you actually have to take the book and turn it uh, side, you know, take it from up to down and turn it side to side. We try to maximize the use of that page, and I thought that's the best way to do that. 
I'm Jim Jansen. If you'd like to reach out to me, please wait until next week. I've got a lot of stuff going on today with this meeting, and we did one yesterday as well, so we're going to have a lot of questions coming in. But uh, please take a look at uh, reaching out to Alan or myself if you would like to visit with us. And Jeffrey Stokes is our professor of finance in the department that helps extensively with the real estate survey as well. A little bit on the farm real estate survey. Chances are, if you're joining us today, you probably have come to maybe an in-person or an online event that we've done something very similar to this in the past. As part of this online meeting, uh, we always try to give a little background. With our background, we've done our real estate work since 1978. As part of this work, we've annually surveyed the people that work in the land industry. This includes appraisers, farm managers, bankers, people working in the industry. The preliminary results each year are published traditionally around mid-March. If we try to shoot for the second, sometimes it trickles into the third week, but kind of that mid-March time frame is when we shoot for. The final report is one where you can actually find a lot of detail on things like what percent of land is in Nebraska is sold via cash or a mortgage or a contract or deed. All the real estate information can be found at the Center for Ag Profitability website. It's actually cap.unl.edu slash real estate. So be sure to take a look at that if you'd like to find some additional information. And the, today's information will be based on what we call the preliminary estimates. And I'll try to be highlighting. You'll see we're going to dance around a little bit in terms of not covering all the slides, but once again, we're trying to deliver this in a way that we are highlighting the top end of what we think is the most important but also trying to keep the most people on this call and keep them engaged. Okay, so a little background here. State of Nebraska, we got 93 counties. To yesterday, we kind of covered the Northeast, East, and Southeast. Today, we're kind of focusing on what I call the Western two-thirds. The Western two-thirds are divided into these regions that you'll know on this slide. These regions are sometimes called the crop reporting districts, if you're familiar with that term. And with the crop reporting districts, they share similar production attributes, expectations for rainfall, crop yield, soil type. Uh, I'll try to give examples where I'll be picking on maybe the Northwest or the Southwest or Central today. Just know these lines are predefined by the USDA and we've chose to stay with them over time. And with these lines, they tend to represent similar features of the area. So today's presentation will talk kind of at the state level, jump down to the district, and then we'll even make it down to the farm or ranch level by the end of our slides. And Alan will be kind of on the farm or ranch level when he's talking about uh, uh, lease provisions, who pays for what, how do we handle these things. This is a quick side note, we are doing a virtual meeting and you never know who you get it um, registered. But today, this isn't where the land is, but this is the people that are have joining us over yesterday and today, this is where everyone's registered from. So it's kind of exciting to see uh, people that maybe grew up or have some relation to Nebraska. And if you zoom in a little bit further, this is kind of the breakout of where we have people. This isn't the land holdings that they're representing on their, this call today, but this is where the different people are living across the state of Nebraska, as well as the United States in the prior slide. So, so it was exciting to see some of those breakout. You just never know who you might get on these calls. All right, so jumping back to the prior slide we had, I said we just subdivided the state into those eight agricultural statistic districts. A few things to note: You will see in your handout that there's a series of slides that relate to different types of land, irrigated and dry land, cropland, grazing land, hay land, and a per acre estimate on those. With those per acre estimates, I'm just going to highlight what I refer to as the all state ag land value. This is taking into account all the different types of land in the state. With that, we have this breakout right here. Overall, the state of Nebraska estimated market value was up about 16%. Uh, there are areas of the state where, you know, somewhere between 11 to 15, eastern Nebraska, northeast, even a little bit higher. Thing to note. When we talk about the market value, that's at a point in time, okay? Point in time on this example is February 1, 2022, compared to one year prior, okay? And if you take the overall state value here in the bottom left-hand corner, and if you take that, and if you would move that back in time, you have this slide. And what this slide right here represents, 
This is the all land ag land value from 1979 to 2022. And um, what we have on here is we have the breakout on the all land ag land value. That's this blue line right here. Okay. And I've used the jagged dash line here to represent this is just a preliminary. And that, what's the one crop grown in almost every county in the state? It's corn. So I put the price of corn, you could use the price of wheat, price of cattle, whatever. It's just to show that there's a relationship between the value of what we do, so crops, cattle, whatever, and the value of what we have, market value of land here in blue, okay? So that's kind of the breakout that we see between the market value of land and where things are at. Obviously, we're in a period of time here, you know, we rode the high up once and then it came back down and 2022 is anyone's guess, but overall, we set the highest market value of land even a little bit higher, about $60 higher than what it was in 2014. And this average value of land is not adjusting the price series here for the price of inflation. But what I would say is, you know, we're seeing some very similar events of what happened in the, about a decade ago. Very similar things are happening right now in our land industry. What's driving this? Well, without a doubt, Alan shared this article with me last November when we initially put these slides together. But this just goes to show you, uh, over the last 15 years or so, price of corn, soybeans, you could use the price of wheat, whatever you wanna use. We have these, you know, it's kind of that roller coaster effect. And when you get into these highs, everyone's thinking about cash rent. They always remember the highs. Well, guess what? There's a lot of periods where it may hit one high, but things trend back down. So be aware, you gotta be cognitive of how do we negotiate these things. You can't be imagining that we're at the high of the high, but what is a reasonable number? The reasonable number is not always that highest price that we see. What, in addition to the high incomes, which without a doubt, uh, I would anticipate crop revenue is probably gonna be higher for most people across the state here for corn, soybean, wheat, um, you know, some of the geopolitical events occurring right now, obviously wheat prices, I would believe are probably much higher than they would have anticipated a few years ago. What else is there? Price of inputs. One of these inputs being the price of DAP, uh, excuse me, 10.340. Very common type of fertilizer used on row crops or maybe even small grains across the state. What do we notice? Okay, you have in here, we have green is in 2020, 2019 is in purple, five-year average is this gray line, and then this red line right here, this represents the price that we've seen in 2021, and I would expect this would be continued on in 2022. So it's kind of a balancing act that we're trying to figure out right now. How do we set an equitable cash rental rate, taking into account the differences in revenue? Maybe we have um, you know, good yields. If it's a dry year, maybe the yields aren't quite as good, but maybe the prices are a little bit better. How do we balance that with the price of inputs? And this is just to give you one indication. The other big area that we've seen a lot of growth is in the different types of chemicals used, um, herbicides, pesticides, insecticides. A lot of the prices, especially for those generic products, much, much higher than they were just a few years ago even. Okay. Another thing I wanted to point out, something that we haven't seen for almost 40 years that we're starting to see right now. I mean, if you watch the news, you'll see it in the headlines. But the or excuse me, the inflation rate, uh, the cost or the purchasing power of the dollar has been declining. Why? Because of the inflation rate. And the last time we seen inflation get so high was roughly 40 years ago. And what happened back then? Well, we've seen some exceptionally high interest rates because we had a clamp down on it. Raising interest rates in the macroeconomic perspective is one way to handle inflation. Mm. Now, obviously it caused a lot of issues with some other things, but what we can say is with higher interest rates, that leads to um, you know, the cost of borrowing increasing. And it, it's an inverse relationship between interest rates and the value of what we have. And I think this kind of demonstrates that when we had that extended period of time here where in interest rates were quite low, we set some of the highest, not inflation adjusted, but some of the highest real values we've ever had for land. So I would anticipate we're gonna see that interest rate clicking up a little bit. I don't know if we're gonna go up to what we've seen in the 80s, but I do think we'll see a little bit higher interest rates. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out, 
if you haven't filed your taxes yet, and even if you have and you've forgotten to apply for this credit, if you're joining us on the call today, either you or maybe some of your clients you might work with own land. One thing you need to be aware of, in the state of Nebraska, there was an act passed that dealt with the Nebraska refund income tax credit for property taxes paid to school. And in Nebraska Farm Bureau, this is one of the best articles I found on this to give you kind of an overview of what's going on. Um, the state of Nebraska passed uh, a law, or there was, I forget, uh, yeah, it was a law, I believe. It specified um, where, what we're gonna do to, to help alleviate some of these high property taxes we're having. There's a state of Nebraska income tax credit on a small portion of the real estate taxes paid to the schools. It's equal to the 25% of whatever amount was paid to the schools. And that occurred during 2021 calendar year. I believe in the prior year, this credit was around, is either 6.3 or 6.8%, but the credit has grown fairly substantially. You need to, um, you need to be aware that you have to file for this credit. It's a state of Nebraska income tax credit. You usually get credits on the federal level, not maybe not nearly as many on the state. So, and the other thing is this credit only applies to the portion of the school funded real estate taxes you pay in that does not exceed any kind of voter opt out. So if you had some kind of a bond or something passed in your district where they override the levy for whatever reason, it's only for the portion up to the levy. If you got a vote, opt out vote, this credit doesn't cover that opt out. So be aware of that. So be sure if you do your taxes to look this up, if you don't visit with your uh, CPA or whoever you go to. And uh, this is applied towards agricultural land if you own any in Nebraska. You have to file a state in Nebraska return. And also if you own a home. So it applies to residential as well as agricultural. So that, in a nutshell, that was kind of a boiled down effort on what is happening in the land values in Nebraska. The second part of my presentation today, we're gonna step through the cash rental rates. We're gonna start at the regional level. And by the end of this presentation, we're going to figure out ways to figure out how to pay a cash rent on uh, cropland or maybe even an example case of a hayland parcel. Okay. First thing here, we take a look at dry land cropland rental rates in Nebraska. This is for the 2022 growing season that was reported as part of the preliminary estimates here in Nebraska. A few things to note, the percent change is compared to 2021. The overall average for the region, we just asked a question on the survey. What do you estimate the dry land, irrigated, whatever type of land is? What do you estimate the overall cash rental rates is? So what's influencing cash rents this year? What influences cash rents in general? Without a doubt, the quality of the land. Do you have a nice configured piece of land? Do you have a piece of land that has terraces? Maybe has a ditch that runs through it that makes it a little bit harder for someone to farm? Uh, is it sandy soil? Is it a little bit darker soil? On irrigated cropland, you have really good water. Do you have issues with the water that you have? All those things influence the cash rental rates. And uh, what we see here, this is a percent change year over year. And um, this is overall average. Now, in addition to the overall average, we also have what is called the high grade and the low grade. And I probably should rename this slide. This really represents what all we ask on the survey. We ask the question, what do you estimate the high third average cash rent is for your area? What do you estimate the low third average cash rent is for your area? And what do you estimate your overall average is? And that's what HAL stands for, the average of the high grade, the low grade, and the overall average. So we see here across the state, an example, in the Northeast District, the average of the high grade was 98. The average of the low grade or the low third average was 50, okay? And uh, this kind of gives you a breakdown. And if you're sitting there, if you're an operator, you might say, okay, these numbers are nice, but I need to know, I need to drill it down to during, you're not even talking at the county level. Remember, these numbers are about a week old. And that's why we did this presentation so late into March was we wanted to have the newest numbers we had available. Uh, in addition to that, there's a survey done by the USDA. The USDA has a division called the National Agricultural Statistics Service, or what some people call NAS. Now, if you're a farmer or an operator in the state, 
you may have been surveyed, surveyed by this group of the USDA in the past. The kind of questions that they're asking relates to things like, how many acres of corn did you plant? What person, you know, if they call in the fall, they might ask the question, how much corn do you have harvested? Um, they also do a cash rental rate survey and their survey is published around the second week of September. And I've had communication with this group out of Lincoln. And my understanding is they will be doing a survey here. And um, I believe they have or will be sending it out shortly for 2022. And they will be producing estimates at the county level as well. Um, I know if you got your hand out in front of you, we had to print them in black and white because of our budget. But uh, in the meetings, I should have had a handout with me. I could tell you, if you're looking at your handout, you'll see, mark the front page where you're at and go to the back end of the report. And I don't know if it's on like page 38 or something back there. You'll actually find, and you don't have to go look, but you'll actually find in your handout, you'll see the state of Nebraska map in the back. In this state of Nebraska map, what is in there is actually, um, what you have on the slide right here. Now, the reason I put it in the back in addition to the front of the book was it's hard to see some of these numbers. You will see in Western Nebraska for 2021, um, there's a lot of counties in white. The reason they did not publish these numbers, either they could not get enough responses back or there are areas of the state, an example, you know, the Sand Hills is a pretty good example. There's not a lot of dry land cropland in that area. But the reason I bring this up is to prove the point. Let's look at the South District here, for example. The South District's roughly this region down in here. The reason I bring this up is you can gain some insight on how cash rental rates vary across the area. An example, Adams and Webster County, those might be closer a little bit, or maybe Adams and Kearney, maybe those are closer to the upper third average for cash rents. Maybe Furnace and Gosper, and uh, maybe those are closer to the lower third. Maybe the average is maybe Harlan and Franklin or Webster to a lesser extent. Kind of gives us some insight on how the cash rental rates vary around in the area. So what I'm getting at is if you go back here a few slides, maybe that upper third average relates to maybe the kind of the eastern area of a region and maybe the lower third, that tends to relate to the kind of the western part. And I don't think that's too hard to fathom because you know, the farther west we move, you don't have to move more than a few counties and the rainfall can vary a lot, especially when you get into western, the western two thirds of the state, you start getting into areas where, you know, if you don't get enough rain, that dry land corn, it can be a good crop some years or it can be a little bit tighter in other years. So that's why we see some of these cash rental rates vary around in these regions, okay? Another thing I was gonna point out, I don't have anything to do with these surveys. But the local ag educators, uh, Troy Walls in Custer County, uh, Sarah Sivis in Lexington, Nebraska, and Randy Sainer in Lincoln County out of North Platte, they actually do surveys at the county level for their regions. So they, you can call their office and, or you can maybe find it online. But I think Randy even does a survey here kind of for Logan, Lincoln, McPherson, in that area and Sarah does Dawson and Troy does kind of Custer and some of the surrounding counties here. So always look for information. I don't have anything to do with their survey. They do a great job doing it. I think you can maybe even find it on their local county extension website. So, all right. So we just stepped through the dry lane cash rental rates. Let's step a little bit into the irrigated. When it comes to the irrigated rental rates, once again, we summarize it by region. Now the center pivot rental rates assume that the landlord owns the entire irrigation system. That includes the pivot, the pump, and the power unit. If the tenant is providing one of those components, you would discount or adjust the cash rental rate lower to account for the fact that you as a landowner don't have to be paying for the upkeep on the pivot, the insurance on the pivot, I had a, dis or a discussion with a stakeholder earlier in this week. They're uh, dealing with this topic. And the one issue they pointed out was, um, you know, insurance on an aid tower pivot, that can be anywhere from 15, maybe all the way up to $2,500 a year. So if you figured that out, you would maybe discount the cash rent to reflect that. And I believe in the back of your handouts, if I'm not mistaken, 
I think there's a corn husker economics article where we actually talk about how do you adjust that cash rent to account for the fact that the tenant is providing one of those components. Okay, so the next thing, uh, the breakout here from the low third to the high third, low third average, let's look here in the Southwest. The low third average was 180. High third average was 270. Average overall was about 225. Um, cash rental rates on average were trending up this year. And I would probably tell you, and based on the survey responses coming in and the comments associated with them, it appears that current commodity prices is one of the biggest driving forces and why we're seeing some of these trends up here in cash rental rates, especially on the cropland. The USDA, with their information, once again, if you're in an area here that's in white, uh, my, to my knowledge, there's not a lot of extensive irrigated cropland out here in the Sand Hills region of the state. So that's one reason we see some of the things the way we do. In addition to those, um, you'll notice some of these counties, take for example here, Scotts Bluff County, Nebraska. To my understanding, and my coworker Jessica Grosskopf out there, there's still a fair amount, still quite a bit of uh, canal or ditch irrigation, whatever you wanna call it. The USDA does not publish a separate rate for irrigated, center pivot irrigated versus gravity or flood irrigated. They kind of create what I would refer to as a weighted average. And that's why we see some of the cash rental rates that we do in Scotts Bluff County. It may, and we tend to see, and I failed to unhide the slides, but I know they're in your handout. We have a gravity or flood irrigated rate by region of the state in addition to the center pivot. And what you will see is the center pivot rates tend to rent for around anywhere, you know, 20 all the way into the mid 40s, less per acre than what the flood rates do. So that some of these rates in this area of the state, I know there's a pocket here in the Southwest and also in certain areas of the Panhandle. If you see those rates, they're tending to reflect a weighted average that is gonna be probably weighted in proportion to the number of acres that are gravity versus center pivot irrigated in the area. Okay. So, so far today, we've stepped through land values. We've stepped into the cash rents and we've covered the cash rents for grazing land, or excuse me, for cropland. The other piece of the puzzle on cash rents, we also have for grazing land. Now, when it comes to the grazing land rental rates, there are mainly two ways that we have reported for cash rents. We have cash rents in the per acre basis, and we also have cash rents in a per pair basis. And uh, what we can see here, uh, we have a breakdown here by acre across the state of Nebraska. What do we see? Well, it seems to me that cash rents are tending to trend up across the state. Uh, they're fairly steady to slightly higher. Now, the profitability in the beef industry, what are we facing this year? Without a doubt, higher feed expenses. Hay, corn, soybean, distillers, whatever you're feeding. That's the number one issue. Number two, or maybe moving to number one, is drought. How do we deal with it? Been a fairly dry winter in most areas of the state, much less snowfall than what I know snow is not always easy to deal with, but that's a down payment on our moisture for the spring, especially when it comes to the cool season grasses we have across the state. So it's kind of something that we're dealing with. And what we see here is we have a pretty good breakdown of cash rental rates per acre across the state in Nebraska. And this is per acre. However you rent your cash on your grazing land, if you're a landlord or tenant, it doesn't matter. What matters is what is someone willing to write it out for or what is someone willing to accept? And if you're dealing with someone and you want to pay in a per acre basis and they want a cow-calf pair basis, I don't care how you pay it. What matters is you can work between the two. Some people even rent by the AUM. Uh, the USDA rates, they give a really good breakdown. This is one category that uh, they give a very good breakdown here for the Western two thirds of the state, just a handful of counties where that are in white. But once again, we can clearly see, you know, we tend to see, especially in the North District, there's higher cash rents on the grazing land tend to kind of come from this Northeast quadrant of the North District. And the farther West we move in the state, the stocking rate is probably going to be reflecting uh, some of those differences. Now, the other thing I wanted to point out on the cow-calf pair rates is search for one cow, for one calf, for one month during the summer grazing season. 
if you're renting during the off season or doing some kind of another setup, uh, you would meet, need to make some adjustments for that to account for uh, some of these differences. And um, who's responsible for the upkeep on the fences or the control of the brush or noxious weeds? And Alan and I, in our in-person meetings where we joke around a little bit more, we always say it's the other party. I've always, and Alan, I think would agree, fences, those are a landowner expense, especially major upgrades because the tenant leaves a property, they're more likely not gonna pull the fence out. Now, basic upkeep annually or throughout the season, if you have a, you know somebody drove through the fence and knocked a post off, I'm okay with a tenant fixing that. But anytime you have serious upgrades, okay, we got a quarter mile that needs to be replaced, we need to take a look at maybe adjusting the rents down I've always felt that those major upgrades or the major upkeep that some years requires, that should be a landlord expense because it's an impermanent, traditionally a fairly permanent improvement paid to the ground. Now the control of noxious weeds, uh, I'm from Cedar County and cedar trees are an issue you know, everywhere in our state it seems like. Um, I would hope you could come up with a solution that works between both parties. Um, cedar trees are a little bit more of a permanent fixture versus weeds annually, you know, weeds that can kind of ebb and flow depending on how good of a job you're doing. But uh, whatever you decide there, you need to find a solution that works for both parties. Okay, so the final piece of today, we're going to be taking a look at how do we calculate cash rents and what's this whole idea related to a flex lease? I'm well aware in Western Nebraska that we have a very high presence of crop shares. I'm just going to float an alternative idea, and maybe this will give you some new ideas, even if you're on a crop share. How do we handle some of this? Um, this slide might seem a little daunting, but let's start with what we know. Many of us know what a share lease is. Um, you pay the landlord, the tenant pays the landlord in the form of a share. And that share is going to be related to a percent of the crop and depending on what percent they get, how the proportion of expenses that may be incurred or shared with a tenant and landlord are going to reflect that. Cash rent, you're paying someone a set amount for the use of the property for a specified period of time, traditionally a one-year lease. Maybe a five-month grazing lease on grazing land. Granted, in the sand hills, we got some fall grazing on meadows that are maybe cut for hay, and there's some different setups up there. But uh, the, if you kind of took a share lease and a cash lease and put them together, that gives you basically the idea is, what is a flex lease? It's kind of pulling out, it starts off as a cash lease, but it combines the elements of risk. Maybe you're gonna do a flex based on the yield, the price, or if you put the two together, the overall income, okay? So there's many different ways to set it up. And if you're a land industry professional joining us on our call today, I'm sure you folks today had even more to this list. But uh, the examples I'm gonna be going over, I think are maybe the three easiest. And I'm gonna be looking at the change um, in these three things here in the center. The first thing, if you ever decide to do a base cash rent, let's say Alan and I are working together, Let's see here. Alan and I are working together. We got some irrigated cropland. I want to pay $195 an acre. It seems to me that's a, an equitable cash rent, counting for the fact that uh, we, we're not certain on what's going to happen to this stuff. And um, input expenses are high. Even if it is irrigated, it's a dry year. I'm concerned about risk this year. Alan really wants to, me to pay $255. All he's seen is the dollar signs this year. You know, the income's looking a lot better on the farms. Well, I would tell them, you know, if things actually work out, we get some rain, uh, even if it is irrigated, you still got to have some rain at some point, right? Um, I would maybe tell him that, oh, I would maybe agree to that if things turn out better. Well, maybe we pick the difference and we meet in the middle at around, say, around 220. That would be an example of taking what the landlord and the tenant want to pay or are willing to accept or willing to pay. And you kind of cut the difference. That's an example of setting the base cash rent, okay? And from that base cash rent, what actually happens? If things are better than we hope for, we're going to pay more rent. If things aren't as good, we're going to pay less. 
And when I say good, what I'm referring to is that, what are you flexing that lease on? Are you flexing it based on yield? This is an example of a flex lease for crops. Yield, obviously we're always concerned about yield. In certain cases, if it's irrigated, maybe you are, yes, you're concerned about yield. Maybe the bigger thing you're concerned about is price. Uh, the example I was telling Alan over the phone the other day, I said, you know, the reason we want to talk about revenue, which combines yield and price, if you only raise 100 bushel per acre and you're selling it for $6, that can be a, a lot different than if you raise 200 bushel at $3 a bushel. What I'm trying to get at in that example is you can have good yields and the prices can be down, or you can have poor yields, but the income can be up because the prices are up. So think about related to your property, and this is something you negotiate with the landlord or the tenant. What is the biggest dimension of risk that you're facing? Okay. So I kind of hinted at this example before. In this example, uh, and you're going to see, um, I, hopefully this is in your handout, and I think this is a really good example. I, as a tenant, I thought 195 was an equitable cash rent. The reason I said that was, you know, I took into account the cost of production and I said, yeah, it is irrigated, but it's just going to be a dry year. I'm replaying 2012 in my mind when I'm renegotiating this. The other side of the deal, landlords looking at 255. They're thinking, okay, things are looking a little bit better. Maybe they all aren't completely aware of the challenges that operators are facing. That's fine. That's where Alan's talk comes in on communication. Can you effectively communicate between the landlord and the tenant what is happening? Well, they pick the difference, they settle at 225 an acre. And from that, we have our flex. Now let's say we're gonna flex off the crop yield. And let's say we hope to raise, I don't know, let's see here. Let's say we hope to raise 150 bushel per acre. And what actually happens was I raised, uh, let's say I only raised 75 bushel per acre for whatever reason. Does that mean my cash rent's gonna drop in half? No. The reason I say that is you have your minimum and you have your maximum. You have your floor. I say 195 is a floor. I don't care if the property gets hailed out. At a minimum, the tenant has the ability to cover a fair amount of that risk with different types of insurance. In this example, and you can negotiate anything you want, but in this example, the minimum is 195. And the maximum is 255. I don't care if the price of corn goes to $12 a bushel. Even if it does, how many people are actually gonna sell it at that amount? What I care about is what is the maximum, okay? If the yield, price, revenue, whatever you flex off of is better, that's why we're gonna look at 255. So our range is from 195 to 255 with an average of 225 is the base starting point. When is the cash rent due? Um, you know, Alan and I, I feel we fairly much agree on this point. I would say a portion of the cash rent upfront when lease is signed is not um, an unreasonable request. The reason I say that is if you're a retired landowner or semi-retired and you're living off a fixed income, what is one expense you'll have to pay twice over the upcoming several months? It's real estate taxes. If you're living on a fixed income and you need money to pay some of these things, I think it's a sign of good faith and good you know, you are signing a contract or agreeing to a verbal contract. I think asking for, for a, a portion of the cash rent up front is not unreasonable. Now, when is the final amount due? Some people do a second payment at some point in the summer and then they finish up in the fall. Maybe you do half in the spring, half in the fall, whatever you decide is your business. But if you choose to do a flex lease, you cannot add demand every dollar up front on day one of the lease because we don't know exactly what's going to happen. And if we don't know exactly what's going to happen, we'd have to settle up in the fall. Uh, some examples here on a flexible cash lease. And this will make more sense on that payment schedule. Okay, so we start here in the next four slides. The top part of the slide relates to the base scenario. The middle part relates to what actually we're flexing off of. And based off of what happens, you see it's, for example, we're down 10% here, we're going to discount the cash rent to reflect that, okay? So in this example, uh, we're gonna discount the cash rent 
10% uh, because instead of raising 150 bushel, where we're off about 15 bushel per acre, and if we're off 15 bushel an acre, we're going to take 10% off, and 10% off of 220 is 22 bucks an acre, or about 198 an acre. Okay, do we pay that amount? Yes, because it is. If you go back to that chart we had, remember we said the minimum cash rent was 195, the maximum was 255. Can you make the minimum cash rent 180 and the maximum cash rent 260? Yeah. You can use whatever numbers you want to use. I would suggest, though, you pick up within a range. Now, the other side of the deal, let's say it actually starts raining here over the next couple of weeks. We get favorable rain throughout the entire growing season. Things are better than we had hoped for. And I know, I've, and especially the panhandle, these kind of yields might be more closely rated associated with irrigated than dry land yields. But the point is, if things are better than we had hoped for, uh, maybe the irrigation water doesn't get turned off, whatever. If you look at the difference here in this example, yields are 10% higher than we had hoped for. With them being 10% higher than we had hoped for in this example, we pay 22 additional dollars in an acre. So remember, 220 times 10% is $22. That final cash rent was 242 an acre. Do we pay it? Yes, it is less than our ceiling, okay? Uh, taking a look at cash rent by a flex in price, we have two scenarios on this slide. And I'm not gonna dive into the details, real nitty gritty. And if you got questions, give me a call on Monday and we can talk this over. But in the left-hand example, we have a cash rental rate of 220 an acre. Right? And on the right, both cases, 220 an acre, we hope to raise 150 bushel. Now, the price we're going to be flexing off of, we're actually using what's called the planting time price guarantee. And the planting time price guarantee comes from crop insurance. It is a 30-day futures price average. And with this 30-day futures price average, we have a case here on the left. We have the case here on the right. The case on the right, um, we have a situation where the prices go from 590 down to 545. And we have a case on the left, we have the prices rise from 590 to 635. Under either case, they're up about 7.6, down about 7.6%. And what you see, if you work through the math, we're going to add more onto the cash rent if prices are higher than we had hoped for because the actual harvest time price from crop insurance is higher. Or we're going to take some off the cash rent because the prices are lower. And the final deal here, and this is hard to explain. And that's why I think if you're really interested in these things, grab a piece of white paper, calculator, maybe even a ruler, go through this table line by line and see if you can replicate the calculation that occurred here. It's kind of like your old high school algebra. In this key example, I have a situation here on the left-hand side. The overall revenue is higher Okay, so we're flexing based off of crop revenue. Revenue is higher than we had hoped for. On the right-hand side, revenue is just off slightly. Prices are down, but the yield was up, okay? In this case, we have the prices are up, but the yield's off some. So depending on what happens, you know, this is example, the final cash rent trending up a little bit. This is an example, the final cash rent trending down a little bit. Uh, this example, we used a base cash rent of 200 an acre, and I failed to update this. That was an error on my part. It should have been 220 an acre. But uh, this does give you some ideas on how does the cash rent vary. And uh, we have a case here where the cash rent rose a little bit. We had a cash rent where the declined a little bit. And what I meant by 200 an acre, I failed to update this slide. It should have been 220 an acre, but still the idea carries forward that depending on the situation that you're associated with, the final cash rent can reflect some of that. Okay, and finally, again, touch on a few ideas on how to set cash rents. There's different ways to set cash rents, and for the sake of time, I'm gonna to touch on the first two. And I know there's been some chats coming in, and I think what's gonna work best is if you hold on until the very last of our presentation today, Alan and I will kind of go through these questions together kind of a Q&A time. Uh, a few ideas here, adjusting the cash rents from the survey data, 
and also the cash equivalent from crop share. First example, let's see you looked at some of this cash rental rate information. You said your county average cash rent was 165 an acre, and the overall average corn yield was 134 bushel. Well, if you take 165 and divide it by 134, that gives us what is called the county rent per bushel, okay, buck 23. Take that buck 23 and move it to the upper right hand side right here. And let's say this parcel of ground I'm yielding, or that I'm farming, not quite as good as a county. You know, it's a little sandier or something. County yield, you may can find this number from, say, like a crop insurance agent. The average yield on the right here, this would maybe be a number that you'd come from your crop insurance records on the property. If you take the county rent per bushel and times it by the average yield, that gives us what? The farm level cash rent. We adjust what we know at the county level, we step it down to the farm level, okay? Second example, cash equivalent from crop share. Many people know what a crop share is. You, if you're in Western Nebraska, you're fairly confident on that. This example, my property yields actually 140 bushel per acre, so the landlord's getting half the yield, roughly 70 bushel per acre, and the tenant's getting another half the yield, about 70 bushel an acre. And uh, when we signed the lease, we figured out, you know, the crop insurance price is about 590, so we decided to pencil that in. Overall, the income per acre, landlord stood to make about 413 in income, but they are also paying about half of the expenses, half of the seed, fertilizer, and chemical expenses. So the difference between the landlord's share of the income minus their share of the expenses, not including real estate taxes. Remember, you pay real estate taxes regardless if you have cash rent or a crop share. The difference between those are the effective return to the owner, okay? And uh, you'll see as you work through the season, okay, if prices jump up in July, maybe you could have, should have gotten more in cash rent or maybe you stand to make more from this. And if it's less because prices back down, your overall effectively you're making about 215 an acre. Well, in this example, you know, if you were a tenant and you told your landlord and you said, why don't I just give you 220 or about 220, let's say 225 or 230 an acre? Is that a good cash rent? Well, under this case, if somebody's willing to give you that much in cash rent, you just eliminated all the risk associated with the crop share. The risk, whether it being a good risk or bad risk, you just eliminated. And uh, if you want, if someone's asking to pay or someone's offering to pay, can you work through an example like this to figure out? Final idea on cash equivalent from hay share. Uh, this would be for our uh, cattle folks across the state. Let's say you had a property that yielded two and a half tons an acre. You had to take on the left hand side here, two and a half tons times a third. Remember, it's a one third share, you get about this much an acre. Right hand side, they get half the crop. Putting hay land up on a share is tends to be a pretty equitable way to do it. Now, if you're doing it on share and you're doing a 50 50 split, this is a case where landlords paying for half of what? Half of the fertilizer expense. So, once again, landlord share of the income minus their share of the expenses. This is how much the tenant, you know, if the tenant came up to the landlord and said, I'll just buy out your share of the hay, cash equivalent from share, cash equivalent from hay share. The reason I like this example, depending on how much it's yielding, is more accurately reflecting that factor. And also, what is hay worth per ton? Now, this is a big number right now, and cattle do eat a lot of hay. So be aware, just because your yields are down, prices might be up on the hay or vice versa. So can you work through these examples? And in this example here on the 50-50 split, I said they threw out about $50 an acre in nitrogen. And, um, I was just trying to get across the point that the cost of nitrogen or other fertilizers have gone up substantially. Uh, egg lease form. If you do not have a lease in writing after Alan's talk, you will see the motivation on why you want to get it in writing. Uh, Egglease101.org is a great resource to take a look at. I highly encourage people to use this website. I find the information to be very valuable. You can find educational pamphlets on the left if you click on the document library or lease forms on the right. Uh, final point I was gonna make, and I know this slide is in your handout. Costs continue to rise associated with our annual land survey. 
It's a public good. And what I mean by that is it's a free source information. If you find any of the information valuable that we're talking about today related to land values or cash rents, we don't charge anything for it. Uh, when we send out the surveys, we send it out twice to every year to everyone unless they respond the first time. Postage, printing, and all these things are starting to cost more. If you want to be able to help us out, and I'm not saying the surveys are going to cost anything. This is voluntary. But just to help keep the ball rolling, we're trying to build a small endowment up for the land, uh, land studies fund. So there's different ways you can contact a person over in the development area with the university, or you can go to a website. Um, anything helps us out. So uh, no charge. We're never going to try to make money off this deal. This is simply to help cover the costs associated with mailing the survey out in the spring every year. And once again, I thank Nick Smith for stepping up and volunteering to add a little bit of money to the pool of money that costs to send everything out to 350 people. That was not a cheap endeavor this year. So if you have any questions on real estate in Nebraska, and as always, if you're another person working in the land industry and you want to sponsor some of the stuff we do, we're always looking for people to collaborate with. And simply, it, it helps to keep this the access to knowledge and access to the knowledge at no cost or low cost to the people using it is a goal that I have always had. All right, final piece for today. Egg, uh, Alan and I do what is called Egg Land Management Quarterly. It's found at cap.unl.edu slash land management. Uh, we kind of do different updates. I don't know if anyone on this call has taken this, but if you have, please uh, consider signing up for this. We don't mail any handouts out. It's a very brief talk, one hour, once a quarter for the four quarters throughout the year. Got any questions? My contact information is in the handout. But with that, um, we're going to save the questions. As Alan's giving his talk, I'm actually going to go through these and we'll try to see if there's any themes emerging in the questions that have been typed in that we can more effectively address these things. So with that, I'm going to stop my share of my screen. Uh, we'll give you about a three to four minute break. You need to get up, stretch your legs, go grab something or use the restroom, go take care of what you need to do. And uh, I, you will find Alan's talk to be very motivating and he'll have a good message to deliver as well. So we're not ending the meeting. Just know we're gonna switch over on the slides and Alan will get started here in a minute. I'm also going to run to the restroom and I'll come back and get going. So just give me a second. Okay, I muted myself. All I was saying, if you are joining us, I'll just make a few comments while Alan is uh, talking or before Alan gets started here. Uh, today's meeting will be recorded or it is being recorded as we speak. Our media specialist, Ryan Evans, will be, I believe, sending out an email, follow-up email, where you can actually go back and watch some of this or you know share the link with someone else if you'd like. Uh, for in-person meetings that we got coming up this summer, Alan and I have a couple different series that we plan to do this summer. And we are also are lucky to get our land management outreach efforts renewed again for this upcoming uh, fall and winter meeting series. 
going to have a new meeting series that's going to be focusing on carbon credits and um, land management issues related to carbon credits. So uh, be sure to stay on and watch these things, and I think you'll find them useful. And the other person I wanted to thank today was uh, Mary Jarvie. She's actually located at the Concord Outreach and Extension Research Center, and um, she does an excellent job. So I see that we got Alan. Is got Alan? Remember to flip on your camera and unmute yourself before you get started. But I at least see your slides on my end. Yeah, I got to make sure I do it right. So hang on. Yeah, I will mute myself I, once I can confirm you got your slides up and going. Yeah, I'm I'm going here. Hang on. Just had to turn my make sure my video and my uh, all that worked. We're good. Okay, how's that look? I am not seeing. You're not seeing what you need to see, are you? Okay, hang on. Uh, I got the wrong share going, just a minute. It's always a mad dash to the last minute of the presentation. All right, I have another, I have another plan here. Okay, let's try this. Um, I'm confused. Okay, hang on just a minute. I can we can run them off my machine too, Al. If you just want me to advance them for you, that's fine. No, you could give me. Can you could give me control too, as far as that goes? There. Let's see. Okay. Let, me, let me try. Let me try it this way. Hang on, just a minute. I got another idea. Maybe um, on how to get this pulled off. Stop share. Let's stop share. Let's take this back. I'm gonna try. Let me try one more time. Just a minute. What am I doing wrong? Ryan, Ryan's coming to help me with Ryan's coming to the rescue here. <laughs> All right. Can you share? Yeah. Hang on, I'm gonna do it this way. Just a minute. Why is what okay? Now I've lost my Isn't working. Okay, hang on. I can't get to that up there. How come I can't get to that up there? Oh, there we go. All right. Uh, does that work, Jim? Hey, Arif, uh, can you click on the more button? Uh, yeah, I can. And there's an option there, Al. You're going to see it says, says hide floating controls. You want to hide that? Hide floating meeting controls right there. Hey, there, there you go. go. Now, how are we doing? There, you're, there's a bar right there in the center of the screen. Do you how's, see that, it? how's that working now? All right, now it's just fine. You're good to go. All right, I will right, meet myself and get to All right. Thanks, Jim. All right, thanks, Ryan. Ryan came, Ryan came to the rescue too. Okay, so I apologize for that technical glitch. I always struggle when I've got multiple screens where I'm supposed to be and um, so to, to which screen I'm sharing and all that sort of thing. Um, I'm going to talk about lease communication. I'm going to talk about succession first. Uh, not so much on negotiation today, but we'll talk about good lease provisions. That'll be quite a bit of what I talk about, especially from a crop share standpoint. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, this is how to reach me. My name is Alan Vanellick. I work here in Philly Hall on East Campus. So I'm, uh, and I, I'm in the same building as the ice cream store, quite honestly. I go down and get ice cream without even going outside. So that looks pretty good. My phone number is listed and my email is listed. Please leave a message or send an email. I'll get back to you as quick as I can. Um, and uh, the, that's the website I work with, cap.unl.eu slash succession. And the succession website has uh, my full two hours of video on succession uh, talk, talk work, that sort of thing. 
and it has some some articles and stuff that I've written on succession and articles that I found from other people on succession. So please get a hold of me. If I'm not in the office, leave a message anyway. It comes to me wherever I'm at because you know, the voice gets recorded and sent to me via email attachment. So I'll always hear your message no matter where I'm at on the road. Okay, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about succession transition. We're gonna talk a little bit about communication, emergency farm planning, and then lease considerations for 2022. That'll be the lease provisions part. First about some stuff on succession. Um, this won't be a substitute for actual estate planning, but I'm just trying to get you to get some get get motivated and do something and get some broad goals set. Um, and uh, you maybe we maybe we even make better use of your professional time. But more importantly, I find out from talking to lawyers that uh, um, I find out from talking to lawyers that that uh, there are more people going to to get their succession plans updated or even started with the six with the pandemic going on. So or finishing up, I guess in this case. So that's where we're at with that. Um, why don't get why don't we get to farm and ranch succession done? Because as I talk to 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 professionals in the business, uh, a short fifty percent, not even quite fifty percent, have succession plans, or the succession plans they have are completely out of date. Uh, and I'm finding out that farmers don't ever really plan to retire. And I'm not. That's not the point of this conversation. I'm not asking anyone to retire. Uh, because they, because farmers don't retire, mainly because uh, us boomers, us old people, uh, don't want to give up control. Uh, we don't have other plants. We don't know what else, what else to do. All we've ever done is farm. Uh, and new newer equipment's making it easier for them to just to continue. As long as I get up in the cab, I might as well just keep going. So those things are all contributing to the idea that most people don't have plans in place or they don't have valid plans in point, place. And again, I'm not trying to get anybody to think that they have to retire, but I will say this, we haven't figured out how to avoid the pine box. So what happens with our, our stuff when we're gone? What are we gonna do with it? Where, where does it go? If you, want to have, if you want to have that planned out, if you want to have a contribution to what happens to that, then I think that you need to be uh, a part of the solution rather than a part of the problem. Because what, what happens more often than not is that farm families experience difficulty discussing the matter. A future, a future of the farm when someone's gone, a matriarch or patriarch. And more often than not, that planning tends to be deferred until some critical life event occurs, which forces a family to address the matter. It's a research study. And it's not only valid in Australia in this case, it's also, uh, it's also valid in the United States too. I can guarantee that because I've had people tell me that. So they have a difficult time discussing issues so they choose not to. Uh, more often than not, planning gets, gets deferred. And now we have a family that's under stress, that's under grief, that's under sorrow, that's under sadness. And we're going to talk to, talk to them about, okay, so what should happen to the farm? What are we doing now? And you have all this uh, emotion that's going to block good discussions. So please, my, my encouragement is to get a plan put together or update your plan while everything's going good before you have cancer hit or before you have that life-changing auto accident or whatever. Um, let's get that done while things are good so we can continue properly uh, when you have that catastrophic event occur in your family. We don't like to plan because we assume it's too complicated. It's mental work. And to be true, it's not thinking about what we're going to plant next. It's not thinking about what bull we use in the cows. It's not thinking about what feed we have to do. It's not thinking about getting out there to take care of a newborn calf. It's not thinking about any of those things. This is stuff, hard stuff to think about. And so we tend to put it off. We don't want to think about deaths. So we don't think about our mortality. So we tend to put it off. And we're also afraid if we do something, it'll be wrong in the future. That's something I just came on in about the last year or so. And, and, and I think the, the interesting thing about that is that if I do put a plan together today and I continue to live for another five to 10 years, guess what? My plan will be wrong. It will be wrong some point in the future because something will change with the family. Somebody will die out of order. Somebody gets sick. Um, you know, somebody has a, a divorce, divorces do happen, uh, somebody has a bankruptcy, and, and it, it screws up the plan. And so, uh, but I always submit this, having a plan and having to change it is cheaper than not having a plan for most families. So please have a plan. You can always amend it, but that, and that'll be cheaper than not having a plan. The guaranteed, talk to a lawyer about that. It's absolutely true. There's three types of planning that have to go into, into any in the end of any career or any, any life. And, uh, and this slide has only been altered very slightly since, uh, you, since you, you, from your handout. But this still has the same three circles and it still says this. At the end of the top circle, it talks about the end of life plans and documents. And on this slide, I added what I consider to be the end of life documents. The power of attorney forms for healthcare, the power of attorney 
forms for the personal affairs, which is the business part, the durable power of attorney for business, business affair, power, business or business affairs part of power, power of attorney. And then if you want, if you choose to have a healthcare directive, those three documents. The cool, the interesting thing about those three documents is that you also have to have them anyone 19 years and older in Nebraska. Uh, I've heard of several cases or two or three cases since I've been in this position the last five years where uh, 19, 20, 21 year olds come going to or from college, gets into a car accident, ends up in the hospital, can't answer for themselves. The parents rush to the hospital. They're going to work with the hospital staff on what happens to their son or daughter. And since they did not have the power of attorney forms in place or healthcare directive in place, the hospital will not talk to them because that 19, 20, 20 year old, 21 year old is an adult. And so therefore HIPAA, uh, HIPAA laws are in, in place. And unless there, there is a power of attorney that names the parent as the power of attorney for healthcare, for instance, they won't, they won't visit with you about that. Um, so it, it gets to be messy and it gets to be expensive if you don't have those in place, even for the young people, so make sure they're in place. The second circle is in the lower left-hand corner. And it's the, what, what, it's the structures, it's the pieces that, put, that go together to make an estate plan, the will, and sometimes a will and a trust, or sometimes a will and an LLC, or other structures like C corps, S corps, any of those things like that, those structures that make the estate plan work. In other words, what happens to my stuff when I'm gone? Here's the, here's the plan for that. And everybody seems to understand that and they put that together uh, relatively easily. The third circle is in the lower right hand corner, and that, that's what I think we fail on in Nebraska, and it's to fail on in agriculture. That's the business succession part. If I'm lucky enough to have someone join, my business, a son, daughter, nephew, whatever. If I'm lucky enough to have my, my personal farm succeed, the bottom line is just this. The business succession is, is critical because if we do it to the, the young, this generation at this time in 2022, the same way we did it back in 1972, 1974, 1976, 1982, if we do business succession the same way we did 40 and 50 years ago, we will have kids fail. And what happened 40, 50 years ago is if I'm one of four kids I, and I'm the farmer, I went out there and I, I just start farming. And, and when mom and dad passed away, they said, uh, hey, Alan, you get 25% because you're one of four and you get to pay your brothers and sisters off. And uh, that sometimes worked and sometimes it didn't. But if I do that today and I say, Alan, you're one of, one of four and I have to pay my brothers and sisters off with 25% equity at today's land prices, I'm out of business. I, I, there won't be anybody that'll stick with me on a, on a loan. There won't be anybody that'll stick with me on, on, on financing that much debt. And so if the, if the brothers and sisters are, uh, 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 need their money right away, and I'm not saying that's wrong, some, some cases they do want that money right away. If they need that money now, they wanna be sold out right away, uh, you're up, you're pretty much, you pretty much can't get that loan. So we have to do a better job with business succession planning. Things like long-term leases, things like first right of refusal agreements, things like uh, when the parents pass away, they're going to have the, the land appraised and we're going to sell it to that on-farm kid for 70% of value. Or, or we're going to give the on-farm kid credit for the sweat equity they've had out there for 10, 15, 20, 25 years, and we're going to discount that ground, ground for them. I guess that that's what I'm trying to say. Let's come up with a way to make sure that the next generation can succeed. I think that's the key part. We just want, we want to make sure that the opportunity is a, is a viable path. That's, that's the point there. Too often, too often we get caught in what I call the circle in action. You realize, number one, you should have a plan. Number two, you should go to a meeting or meet with a lawyer. Number three, oh, this is, wow, it's complicated. It's giving me a headache. I don't want to think about this anymore. So you take, you go on, it's right on to step number four and take no action at this time. And you sit in number four for three months to three years or longer. And, and, and I would encourage people to get out of that circle of inaction. How do I know that that exists? Go talk to any lawyer and they'll tell you exactly that it does exist if you explain to them what that is. Because I, I explained it to a lawyer that I work with and he said, absolutely true. Uh, and, and by the way, how do I know about the circle of inaction? It happened to me too, because I, I knew that, that I needed, I've been doing these to talk, some of these talk, parts of this talk for 15 years now. And I knew that uh, as of, uh, for the first five or six years that I had an old will from early in my marriage called the I love you. I call it the I love you will. The early, the early the first, first year or two of my marriage, uh, first when I had children that were seven and five years old, um, back 40 years ago, or not quite 40 years ago, it'd be about 30, 35 years ago, I, my I love you will said, honey, I love you. If I'm gone, everything goes to you. And her will says, my wife's will says, honey, I love you. If I'm gone, everything comes to me. 
And it also had the third component, which talks about um, who my guardian, who the guardianship is for my children, you know, guardian one, guardian two, guardian three, guardian four, if you want to go that deep. And you, you, you specify who you want to have take care of the children if you're both gone. That's that original I love you will at the beginning of a marriage. But as you start to get assets, and you start to get uh, stuff, you have to do something with that. And you have to um, update that because you you have to be a, have to have a better plan basically. And you can dump the part about the guardianship thing too. Let's get to something sequential. Uh, you realize you should have a plan, or there's a catastrophic event. You go to a meeting and or meet with a lawyer. And I think the other part of that second step is just to simply have people think about um, uh, what do I have? Making a list of your stuff. Uh, there, I have an article on my website that talks about how to put together that how to put together or evaluate going to that lawyer and get ready for that meeting with the lawyer. Look at that article before you go to see the lawyer and put together what you have, what you own. And then the third part is you get the family together to say, okay, this is what I have. Here's what the lawyer is discussing with me. What do we all think? Who wants to be in? Who wants to be out? Who's interested in this? Who's interested in that? I mean, I had, I've, I've met with families where they hadn't had that conversation yet. One family didn't know that the son and the daughter-in-law were going to come back to the farm before with the four of us sat down together, mom and dad and, and the, the two children who were now in their late thirties. And, 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 and all of a sudden mom and dad had this revelation, well, the kids do want to come back. And they didn't really hear that before because they had communicated that. So get that family together and talk about those kinds of things. Who's interested in what? And who's interested in grandma's yellow pie plate? Who's interested in other uh, antique heirlooms that the family may have, may have? So please, please have that discussion. Then the matriarch and patriarch, no, not the rest of the family, but just the people, the mom and the dad have to pick some options and decide what they want to do. And then they, get, they go back to the lawyer, get a succession plan developed, they sign it, congratulations. That kind of ends it typically, but I would also suggest one more step that in three or four or five years, you have to do a good job of, um, you have to do a good job of reviewing your, your estate plan and making changes if something changes for your, in your situation. So um, those are the steps I think should happen. Can I get through the first five of these in, in three months? Maybe not, but you can sure get done in four to six months. So, so if you really set your mind to it, if you don't have a good plan or an out of date plan, uh, if you set your mind to it, you could have it done by 4th of July and have a real 4th of July party because you celebrated the fact that you have your, your plan put together. So the lesson is simply this, have a plan. No plan leads to chaos. Chaos causes greed. It's a negative, powerful emotion that screws up families, especially when you have situations where mom and dad may have made a decision but didn't bother to tell the kids what the decision is or just simply didn't make a decision at all decide, oh, I'll, we're going to be gone. We don't care what the plan is. The kids will just have to figure that out because that causes greed and greed splits, greed splits families. And I'll show it to you right now in this video where they did an experiment with monkeys. They put two monkeys side by side and the monkeys had to perform a task. You'll see that in a second. As long as they were, as long as they received the same thing for performing the task, in this case, each received a piece of cucumber, the monkeys were terribly happy. Then they changed the experiment and the second monkey didn't receive a cucumber, he received a grape. And so you can see what happens in this situation. I think the sound will come through. I think I checked those boxes, so I think we'll be in good shape. Um, and if it doesn't, uh, Ryan or Jim hop, hop on and we'll figure out how to deal with that. But here we go. Let's see what happens. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task. And and we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. Oh, shoot. I just messed that up. She tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. So 
So, so the point is simple. If you think, if you have family members that don't know what's going on or you don't have a plan and family members don't think they're going to be treated equitably, they will behave exactly like those monkeys behaved. I had a phone call in my office about four months ago, five months ago now from a farmer. He had some succession questions. I answered these questions. He said, Alan, I have something else to tell you. He said, I'm being, I, I, I have one sister. I'm Don Farm kid. Mom and dad left more of the farm to me because they didn't think fair was equal or equal is fair. They thought that I should get credit for sweat equity out here. And so they gave me the more of the land and they gave my sister some of the other equities, but it wasn't the same in terms of total dollar value. Now my sister is challenging the will in court. And so I'm not saying that I'm not saying that that's right or wrong. I'm just saying it happens. And if you if you don't you, if you articulate your plan carefully, you're going to have situations like that. And you know, in that kind of situation, who wins? I submit the only people to win in that situation are the lawyers. And I think I also submit that the family doesn't win. More importantly, the family's probably those that brother and sister probably never getting together again for Christmas, Easter, you know, family hall, family celebrations, or funerals, any of those things. And I think that's sad. So be sure that you um, be sure that you have a plan and, and you know what you're doing. Um, the second part of this thing is some communication and need for all farm and farm and ranch operations. And the thing I would say about communications is simply this. I think 80 or 90 percent of the families, 85, 90 percent of the families get along great, great in Nebraska. They get along fine. They, they, there's no problem. They, they learn. They understand that it's family first. and They're going to figure it out. And then the other 10% call Jim or myself or, you know, whoever, suggest Jessica or whoever. And so please understand that, that uh, when I get phone calls, it's because something's gone to heck in a handbasket. And if I analyze the, the calls that I get from families not getting along, it's almost 100% of the time it's because of bad communication or no communication. Did you hear what I said? 100% of the time it's either bad communication or no communication. So please make sure you have your family communication in good shape. Community listening is the key. Uh, the main thing is you have to repeat back to the other partner or the other person that's talking to you. Did I hear you say that you wanted to change the rent for next year? And then you say, then you say, why, why is that justified? Or, or how did you get come up to that? How did you come up with that uh, information? Uh, you know, what, what is your rationale? You just have to, you have to get them to talk about that more instead of attacking. Hell no, I won't pay more. That's too much, you know, excuse the language. But the point is um, you have to repeat what they thought you heard them say and ask them who, how, why questions, that sort of thing. Because the key to communication is seeking first to understand before you can be understood. You can't immediately attack. You can't immediately say, I'm not doing that. You can't immediately start to be disagreeable. You have to make sure you understand exactly where they're coming from avoid yes or no questions, ask them questions that are open-ended so they have to respond and give you the rationale for what they're saying that's making you upset. So feet, seek first to understand, then be understood. Show empathy, show concern. Show If you show proper appreciation for the party, I can get, almost guarantee you that you will have better, um, better relationships with and whoever you're working with, a landlord, tenant, family member, whoever it is, doesn't matter. You have to give them proper appreciation and respect. Uh, focus on the intent of the message that you're listening to or trying to deliver. And it's, you have to listen more when emotion's high, you got to get to the heart of the issue, you don't feel you understand, or when the other person feel doesn't feel understood, especially when the other person doesn't feel understood. You have to work on these things very carefully. The communication mistakes that I find in farm families are kind of, this is not an exhaustive list. As a matter of fact, if you have a little communication mistake, please send them to me. But but uh, uh, here's some, some things. Asking a question, not to find out what they'll say, but to say what you wanted to say. Uh, I, 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 I find that to be interesting because I'll have people talk to me, but they don't wanna know what I think. They wanna just be able to continue to talk about how the, how the Husker football team's doing, or why did this guy leave, or what, what, well, how come this guy's coming, and all those kind of things like that. But they don't care what I have to say. They just wanna talk about what they wanted to say. Making any assumption of what someone else will say and thinking about how I respond to other person's talking. So I, I have to be careful of those things in an extension office or in my 30 year county career, because sometimes I would get a message, hey, call so, so and so, call Joe down the street there because he's got questions about ABC. That's what my message said. When I called Joe, I said, so hey, tell me about ABC. What, how can I help? And they go, wait a minute. 
it's not ABC, it's XYZ or something else. It'll be something just so that's an assumption that you have to be careful of and make sure you're listening to figure out what their real problem is. And then you also have to make sure you ask, stop yourself to ask a question about, to ask a question, a clarifying question about the other person said before, before you start responding to what they're talking about. In other words, they, they describe something instead of responding immediately, you say, okay, did I hear you say this? Uh, repeat back to them what you thought they heard them say. Is that what you said? And then you can respond. Um, or, would you, especially when you're working with immediate family members, I have this happen with me with my wife and my children all the time. We try and fix an issue without being asked. In other words, we're communicating with someone. And they're telling us about a problem. The other party's telling us about a problem. This happens to my children and my wife all the time. They're telling me about something. And I immediately, as the parent or as the father, or excuse me, as the husband, I want to fix it. And uh, we, we shouldn't do that. Sometimes people just want to get stuff off their chest. And so here's the video that illustrates that last point on this slide. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless. And I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just... Sometimes it's like... There's this achy... I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. That sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on! Ow. If you would just don't try to see things my way, do I have to? Keep so again, I, I run into that all the time, especially with my wife and my children. Where if I try and fix it without being asked, I can run into some trouble because sometimes they just want to get something off their chest. They want to describe a problem. And a lot of times, if you just let somebody completely describe a problem, ask them questions about the problem, they, in their mind, by describing what's happening to them and what's going on in that situation, they actually can solve their problem by themselves. And so uh, just think about that a little bit. And sometimes that can happen. So anyway, those are some of the communication mistakes I wanted to point out. Uh, third slide, third part of my talk is a little bit on emergency farm planning, just a couple, just one slide, actually. But we're talking about all kinds of risk here, right? We're talking about risk of uh, what land land's worth. We're talking about the risk of what cash rent or, or crop share, all those, those things can be. I'm gonna talk about the risk of how to set up a proper uh, lease arrangement here in a minute. We're talking about the risk of uh, setting up, not having a succession plan, the importance of having a succession plan. Well, here's the emergency farm planning risk. Um, if you get hospitalized this afternoon, you got chores to do, who's doing chores tonight? Who pays the bills uh, by by the 20th of the month or the first of the month or whenever you have to have them do if you can't answer, cannot answer it for yourself? Who knows where the stuff is at, like safety deposit box keys, spare keys to the house, garage door codes, passcodes to the bank account, other online passwords. If I'm a if I'm an out of town son and I have my dad's got trouble if he's got he can't do chores who who am I calling for him to help with the chores? Who if my mom's not available or isn't is, is incapacitated? Who, who's, what are their numbers? Who, who's my, who, who do I work closest with as a neighbor that you could call and get help, especially if you're incapacitated and can't call, make that phone call yourself. Does anybody else know who to call for, for you? Uh, if there's a fire or other emergency, do you have, where are the electrical disconnects? Make sure somebody else knows besides yourself and where are the dangerous chemicals and chemicals or fuels stored um, so that um, you can avoid having uh, emergency staff go somewhere and get hurt further from uh, bad fumes, that sort of thing. So, and this is not an exhaustive list. It's just a kind of a place to start and things to think about and then things to, to, to plan for and then have, have something put in place so that to something would happen to you that something could go on at some, some degree of normal, normalcy. 
Okay, so uh, these considerations for, especially for this year, as we think about what's happening with the prices and expenses and all that sort of thing. All right, so in the panhandle, this is kind of Western Nebraska talk. So in the panhandle, we have to understand that crop share is pretty much the king, still the king out there. I mean, there's some, some instances where we still do some, do some cash rent, especially in the Valley on certain crops, but we're doing most of it crop share and that's fine. Because the crop share says you percent you receive a percentage of the crop for le leasing the land to the tenant, they get the other percentage of the crop. A uh, landlord usually shares the input production costs for raising that crop based on their share, what they got for their share. It's a very equitable, fair way to rent, in my view, because um, if, if expenses are split properly, it, it will mar follow the market perfectly, whereas cash rents don't necessarily do that. Let me explain for a minute. It's 2006 to 2012, and what's happening with corn and wheat and soybean prices, they're, and even dryable bean prices, they're going up like this, they're going up. And what happened to, to uh, cash rents? Cash rents went up, but at a slower level. Who really had good years back in those years? Well, the, the tenant did. Now we're at 2013, and we have to go to 2019. What happened with crop prices? They were generally going down or lower, what happened to, to cash rents? Cash rents were moving lower in some cases. In some cases, they didn't move at all. They stayed steady. So who's getting a good deal in these years? The, the landlord. Now we got prices going back up again. I don't, even want to do, I don't even want to talk about that because the expenses have jumped so exponentially in terms of fuel and fertilizer and those seed and those kind of things that I, it, it, it's kind of all bets are off right now. I think a sharp pencil is more important than ever. But all I'm trying to say is that cash rent couldn't keep up with going up or going down because it does it's in, in relatively inelastic. It doesn't move fast enough. Whereas what happened with crop shares? Crop shares followed this up perfectly, 2006 to 12, followed this down perfectly, 2013 to 19, and now it's going to follow right back up perfectly because you're getting a share of that crop. You're taking the risk and taking the reward. Remember that. The, you know, just remember what Jim's slide showed. Jim had a bunch of boxes on one of his slides. You can go back and look at it. And the top box on the left side said, um, your left, top box on the left side said uh, crop shares. The middle box said flex lease. And the bottom box says cash rent. It had to do with the landlord's uh, risk there. The top box for crop shares is meant that the landlord takes the most risk, but also gets the most reward. Uh, the middle box is a flexible lease, which the risk and reward are somewhat mitigated or somewhat shared. And then the bottom one is cash rent, and the landlord doesn't have any production risk necessarily. As long as the check's good, their, their risk is minimal. But their reward's minimal too then. If there's a great year from a farming standpoint, yield and, and price or both, then they, they get their cash rent. That's what they get. That's what they signed on for. And so you have to, you have to balance that all out. How do you want to do the risk? And how do you want to do the reward? Jim referred to it and I'll refer to it again. And that's what I just tried to illustrate. So please be equitable with your rent and please take on the amount of risk that you're willing to take on. If you're unwilling to take risk, then that's fine. Take cash rent. If you're willing to take some risk, then go to a flex lease or go to crop share. Crop shares work because you have shared management decisions, more land under control. You can mentor a younger farmer to get started if they need that. You got tax management because you can time your income and when you're going to take your checks, that sort of thing, in your expenses. Uh, you share on a good crop or good income uh, that that risk for that. The downside for a landlord is that uh, they don't like to pay expenses. They don't like to have to worry about marketing their share of the crop, and they share that production risk if the crop is bad or if the income is bad from a low lower price. Typical shares, depending on what part of the state you're in, for crop share. Um, the most common across the state would be 40, 60, 50, 50, 33, 67. With the lead, if there's not an even split, then the lesser amount goes to the landowner. And central, um, okay, so in eastern Nebraska, uh, from uh, Lincoln, let's say, on up to the northeast corner, it's more 50-50. In all irrigated ground, it's 50-50. In southeast Nebraska, south central Nebraska, southwest Nebraska, uh, within a couple, three counties of Kansas, it's pretty much all 40, 60, or it tends to lean that way. And the panhandle tends to be 33, 67. Understand that in eastern Nebraska, from, from Grand Island on east, cash rent's still most popular, but in the panhandle. And in southern Nebraska, it's kind of a split. And in western Nebraska, the crop share is most popular. 
So it depends on the neighborhood, the, the crop and the expenses and how that's all get put, how it gets all gets put together. And one I, quick idea I have for people on, on crop shares is if, if, if you're interested, uh, land, landowners don't like to pay expenses. If you don't wanna pay your share of the production expenses, take a smaller percentage of the crop. Um, and I'm not saying these are, these are the right examples. I'm just giving you ideas. Uh, 3070 or 2575, even 2080, maybe in the panhandle might work um, because, you know, it's it, so just understand that um, you have to push the pencil on that, figure out what those percentages are. Maybe you're going to want to go with 3169 or something like that. You just have to figure out what that number is and you can make that work out for uh, a, a smaller percentage of the crop for the landowner, but not paying production expenses. Of course, you'd still have your, your land taxes, you still have your irrigation system upkeep. But that would be that would be those are typical expenses. Uh, as far as income on crop share, both parties receive revenue from the crop. They, they they receive crop insurance payments if they purchase crop insurance, and they receive their share of the governor government disaster payments when those are made available. In terms of expenses, uh, typical split on expenses is that the landowner pays their taxes, their irrigation operation fees, maintenances. Maintenance fees, irrigation ownership costs, depreciation insurance, repairs, taxes, interest, their share of crop insurance, uh, fertilizer, insecticides, fungicide, herbicides, those inputs, energy for irrigation, their share of the energy for irrigation, their share of the seed, and they market their share of the crop. Tenant will to provide all the labor. They provide minor irrigation equipment and repairs and maintenance. I'll make another comment about that in a minute. They'll talk, they'll do provide all the field operations. They'll do the cost of transporting the landlord's share of the crop. They'll harvest it and transport it to a place that's designated that they both agree to. They pay their share of the crop insurance, their share of the fertilizer, insecticide, fungicide, herbicide, their share of the irrigation energy, and their share of the seed, and they market their share of the crop. The point of negotiation, however, is I find out as I do these talks across Nebraska, every neighborhood's a little bit different. I mean, the panhandle's different than the rest of the state, but um, irrigation repairs, uh, sometimes is specific types of repairs are absolutely the tenants, other specific repairs are that of the landlords. And uh, uh, like flat tires, the, the tenant will take care, should take care of flat tire, that sort of thing. Um, and it, what I find is that most common is that there is a deductible in place. In other words, the tenant will pay for the first 300, 500, 700, even thousand dollars of repairs to that pivot. And the landlord covers after that. If it's a more expensive repair, then the landlord helps pay make those those uh, repair covers those repair costs. The main thing I hear here is that hear about here is I'll have a landlord call me up and say, well, that, that my tenant just changed out the whole sprinkler package on the on the pivot and didn't tell me he was going to do it, and now I got a seven thousand dollar bill and I don't have the money to pay that. Uh, so you make sure that the tenant, make sure we have the communication that the tenant will go back to that landlord and say, hey, I'm going to make a major change. So my pivot nozzles are shot. They're wore out. They're not doing the right thing. I got to put a new pivot, the, 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 actual, the actual sprinkler package. And so just make sure that communication takes place. Custom application, energy for irrigation is usually split. That's usually not a bone of contention, although you hear situations where somebody's not one to pay their share or whatever. Um, you know, so just have communication about that and just go with the neighborhood policies. I don't have a specific recommendation there. Custom application is interesting because if I hire the local app, a custom, the local chemical dealer to apply my herbicide, uh, in some parts of Nebraska, that application cost is split according to the shares. And in some places, the landlords will go, no, that was a, that is a field operation and the tenant pays for that. And so that, that's kind of a case by case basis, whatever you agree to is more important to, than what I have to say about it. Seed is typically split at the 50-50 crop share level and 40-60 or 3367 depends on where you're at, what's going on. I would split seed personally because the landlord's getting a lot of value from some of these higher cost seeds, even though that costs more, you're getting uh, help with the, with the Roundup Ready and you're getting help with some of these other um, genetically modified seeds that, that help reduce it, um, either herbicide costs or to help it reduce insecticide costs. So I think that's important, important to <coughs> contribute to and consider. And then in some cases, the, the crop is actually co-mingled in the same bin of the, all, the, all the crop from this one field or this one farm that they're sharing, sharing rent on is put in one bin. And then the, when the tenant sells his share, he just, he just splits the loads. 
uh, to the landlord too. And then that means the tenants marketing the crop, that's negotiable, no negotiable. Whatever you agree to is more important than anything I've got to say. I don't have a database or textbook to tell you what to do here. Whatever you agree to is more important than anything I've got to say. But if you're getting along great, don't worry about what I've said. I'm just giving you what I hear most commonly across Nebraska for crop share expenses. Now, this now the rest of this is going to probably apply more to both crop share and cash rents, so I'm, it'll include both. The main thing here I wanted to get the main point here I want to make with this slide is just to say the the landlord and tenant have to decide how they want to be communicated with. In other words, if uh, you know there's some landlords that that would prefer a phone call or a letter, especially if they're out of state. Some landlords are great with an email, and some landlords would even prefer a text. I know that, you know, I have, I have a, a tenant taking care of my farm, the farm that I happen to own, and uh, I'm fine with a text from my, from my tenant. I don't have to be, a, it doesn't have to be a phone call. Just send me a text or send me a text with a picture. That's worth a thousand words, right? And so, and then that, that's still absolutely true. And then ideally the landlord and tenant need to meet several times per year. And I think meeting in person is important. I think meeting face-to-face -face is important. You need to meet when you get the re re lease renewed or signed. You need to meet prior to the year to review crops plans. Maybe that's the same meeting with the signing of the lease and reviewing crop plans is the same thing. It doesn't matter to me. But I think that sometime during the growing season while the crops are standing in the field is a good time for the tenant to get the, the landlord out there to see what's going on. I think the landlord should be outstanding in that field. A double double meaning there, but anyway, at the at the end, end or at, at harvest, I think if the landlord's available in the area and the tenant can get them up in the cab, they should go ride with them at, on harvest on that farm. I think it's a very important to have them do that if they're available and if that can happen. And then, of course, you meet up meet late in the year to wrap up the lease and get final payments made as necessary. Now, some other specific things to think about when we set up a lease, either for crop share or or um, especially for cash rent is if we have a cash rent situation and the, and, the, um, and the farmer, I think we probably have some Eastern Nebraska folks sitting on this morning too, but we have a cash rent situation and a farmer's paying a relatively high cash rent uh, to, to, to $300 to $400 an acre or something way up there. Uh, the point is, um, I think there's a good chance that phosphorus will not be applied this year because phosphorus, that load of, see that tractor pulling that, uh, that fer dry fertilizer spreader through the field? I think he's probably, he's probably applying lime, but they used to use the same fertilizer spreader to apply phosphorus, there's 10, 18, 1846, 18, 1846, the phosphorus fertilizer, dry phosphorus fertilizer. The bottom line is, Last year, that, that load was costing somewhere between $350 and $400 a load. And now it's this year, it's costing over $900 a load for that load of fertilizer. So it's more than double. That's my point. And so phosphorus I mean, likely won't, won't be applied as much this year, I'm afraid. And so I think the main thing is we have to make sure that the tenant is not just mining the soil, especially on some of these high cost leases. I think that we the landlord could be putting a provision in the lease that talks about a minimum phosphorus level. You check with your local agronomist on that, but it's typically going to be around 18 to 22, 23, 25, something like that as a minimum phosphorus level, parts per million phosphorus in the soil, um, around 20, 25 for a minimum phosphorus in the soil. And uh, if you got more than that, it's fine, but uh, you know, I don't know that uh, my point is I don't think tenants will be putting on replacement phosphorus this year, and I think that's okay. Just make sure the minimum is being left. Um, so uh, the other thing I want to talk about quickly is lime. In the panhandle, you don't worry about lime. But in eastern Nebraska, central Nebraska, you do. Lime should be a typically would be a landlord expense. Uh, that should be the end of the story. However, I run into situations where the tenant is applying the lime and they shouldn't be, but they are. Then they need to be protected with a clause and lease because in a lot of cases, if they put on good ag lime, 30, 30 to $50 a ton, then they need to be, then it's going to last 8, 10, 12, 15 years. And they need to be, they need to have a clause and lease that says if my lime is expected to last 10 years and I'm off this lease after five, I want to be reimbursed for part of that lime cost, maybe 50%. That's something that has to be negotiated before the lease starts and before you apply lime. Uh, so please have those discussions. But my bigger recommendation is the tenant doesn't apply lime, the landlord does. Um, so to fixing excessive erosions, the great big gullies and stuff, that's really kind of a landlord's expense. However, some of the tenants now have equipment in place that they can uh, do a nice job of fixing some of the stuff. They're getting bigger equipment and bigger, you know, bigger blades and bigger dozer attachments and all this sort of thing, soil movers and all kinds of other stuff, even backhoes in some cases or, you know, excavators. 
So the tenant's doing some of this stuff for the landlord, but here's the, here's the bigger issue for me. Instead of going out there and just fixing that ditch, I think the other discussion that has to occur is, um, where's that water coming from? And what can we do to, to fix that so we don't have that ditch even forming? I know on my farm, what I've tried to do over the last 30 years, 30 years, yeah, 32, 32 years I've owned my farm, uh, I've tried to spend some money out there to put in things like parallel terraces with tile drains so that we don't, so we keep that water in a controlled release from the field rather than this gully wash from the field. So we keep that field in better shape and keep more soil in place. That's our job, I think, is to keep the soil in place so we have a productive farm. Non-crop acres, who controls trees and noxious weeds? I think that the landlord should be controlling the trees and the, and the tenant should be controlling noxious weeds. Jim said that. And uh, I second that notion. And the, remember on the cedar trees, you wanna get them when they're three foot or shorter. That's when they're easy, most easily controlled. Uh, so that, that pasture I'm showing you right there with the shorter trees or the CRP, whatever it is there with the shorter trees, get them now. Don't let them get up to eight, 10, 12 feet. Then you've got to go in there and mechanically harvest them. And that's, that's an expensive proposition. So don't, don't do that. Get them when they're small. Um, tillage versus no-till and organic versus non-organic. All I'll say about that is don't have a tenant come to you or, or as a landlord, don't go to a tenant and ask for no-till and organic because that's just a bad plan in Nebraska. No-till says I'm going to control weeds with herbicide. Organic says I'm going to control weeds with cultivation. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't have no-till and organic right on control weeds at all. So just be careful about that request or be careful not to accept that request. And the GMO versus non-GMO, don't have somebody says, hey, we want non-GMO crops because the GMO horse is already out the gate. We have like 90 some percent of our crops are all GMO crops. Just live with that. That's that's just the way that's going to be. And my crop residue talk, I'm going to, uh, the rest, uh, what I have to say about that, I have on a different slide, so I'm going to go on from there. If you have a pasture, it's a big for Western Central and Western Nebraska to have pasture. Who's taking care of the fencing? Have that discussion before it starts. Typically, a landlord has to have a fence in good shape before a tenant will take on a pasture, and then it's a tenant's job to maintain it. And it's a tenant's job to get, like Jim said, to get a credit for re replacing part of the fence. That's fine. I also, for pasture, know what's happening with the big three, the fire, drought, and hail. Um, you have to get those big three things discussed before that pasture lease starts. What happens if you have a fire and there's no, nothing else to graze? Uh, who's taking care of the fence after a fire? Those kind of things. Hail, what happens if you get completely hailed out? What, where's where the cow's going to go? And same thing with drought. So make sure those discussions are held before the lease starts so you, can, you know what the plan is when you have that disaster occur. Hunting rights of crop ground versus pasture. In crop ground, because the lease is all year round, it's a 12-month lease. Hunting rights belong to the town. Okay, all right, let me back up. It depends. On crop ground, it depends on if you have a crop share or, or a cash lease. If you're crop share, you're going to share the hunting rights, have the discussion of who's going to hunt. In many cases, in some, no, not many cases, some cases the landlord will just want to keep those hunting rights. That's their right to do that. Uh, on, on crop ground that is cash rented, the, the, the hunting rights will go to the tenant unless it's held out of the lease by the landlord. And sometimes they'll do that. On pasture, the hunting rights will typically be the landlord's because the most typical pasture lease in Nebraska is either a five or six month lease that starts on May 1st and goes to October 1st and November 1st or June 1st, it goes to November 1st. So in other words, the pasture lease ends before hunting season starts. So the hunting rights belong to the landlord. Um, and then the other thing to talk about there is just quickly this, if I rent Jim, excuse me, if I allow Jim to go to my farm and hunt deer, and I don't charge him. Jim, I'm a good guy. There's some good deer out there. There's a big, there's a big monster buck out there. Go harvest it. Get some does too while you're at it. And uh, Jim goes down there and he hunts. But more importantly, he uh, had, there's a hole there that I don't know about. And he falls into the hole and he breaks his ankle. Can Jim sue me for having a hole out on my farm? If I, if the Nebraska Recreation Use Law, which has changed five, six years ago now, says that if, as long as I didn't charge him to go hunt on my place uh, and now he gets hurt, that's on him. In other words, the recreation use law is trying to get people to encourage people to allow their land to be hunted and or, or used, not even for hunting, but for uh, ATV, horseback riding, fishing, uh, any, any of those things like that, snowmobiling, if you have snow, those kind of things. Okay, so um, if I don't charge for the use of that ground, then there's no repercussion to me necessarily. If I do charge, then I have to make sure that I have uh, my farm in good shape, but I also have to make sure that I have good, well, either way, you have to make sure you have good liability coverage 
and it, the coverage that cover, covers you, know, you charging for use of, use of the ground, or even even a good liability coverage for the for, for the first situation where somebody didn't pay to use the ground. So if you got other questions about that, put them in the chat or put them in the Q and A. Um, other provisions for leases that I think should be talked about before the lease starts is how we're going to handle corn stocks. Corn stocks uh, use um, in a crop share is is shared. Corn stocks use in a cash rent. The corn stocks belong to the tenant unless they're held out of the lease or there's some discussion about that ahead of, uh, ahead of time. My main management concern with corn stocks is should they be grazed? Absolutely, I'm, I'm all in favor of having corns, every acre of corn stock grazed. Should they be removed for uh, clean, clean cut for bedding? I understand that happens. And I'm, I'm not against that, but I wouldn't let somebody go out and harvest my, my, all my stocks off my corn field every time it's corn. In other words, I'd wanna rotate that around to different fields so that I don't have one, one place being harvested for stocks all the time. That's too hard on phosphorus, it's too hard on, hard on organic matter. It drops that too much. It, I also, if you're going to have a, something harvested, then you probably better have the conversation about what you're going to do for a cover, cover, cover crop in that situation. Or if you're having a field harvested for corn silage, what are you going to do for a cover crop? I think those those are discussions to be had before the lease starts. Manure application. Um, I'm all in favor of manure, and I think we got to use manure, and I think manure is a great source of special organic matter and especially phosphorus. And, um, so it's awesome. But I think we have to limit the amount of manure we put on based on, uh, well, the CAFOs have to do it. The confinement animal feeding operations, the big livestock producers have to have a manure management plan in place, which, which limits the amount of manure that can, can be applied based on phosphorus use or phosphorus application. I think that's important. Uh, just don't, don't go out to the same field with your manure every year. The phosphorus just gets too high. And what we have to understand about phosphorus is that it, it, it does not sink into the soil. It's not going down into the groundwater like nitrogen does. But phosphorus sits kind of up on top. And so if you have those great big rainfall events, where does phosphorus end up? It ends up in the rivers, ends up in the Platte, ends up in the Elkhorn, ends up in the Missouri, and ends up in the Mississippi Delta. And that's, that's where we're getting a black eye for in agriculture. So let's be careful about how much phosphorus we get out there. By, by limiting manure application based on phosphorus needs uh, more than anything else, probably. Otherwise, manure is terrific. I want to have it, but I want to have it every third or fourth year. I don't need to have it every year. Uh, communication is important for a good lease, either a cash lease or a crop share. And, and even for a cash lease, it's important to communicate. Make sure you, the tenant needs to tell the landlord what's happening out there, moisture, weed disease, insect pressures. Send me emails or texts to let them know what's going on. Uh, and, and, you know, sending a picture like that, especially for out-of-state or out-of-town landlords, is really important for them to understand what's happening to you during that crop year. The landlord has to communicate, too. I think the landlord needs to rethink what they're doing uh, with their farm and ha have a goal or a vision for their farm. In other words, what is the, what is the big picture? What do I want to have happen with my farm? What's important here? It shouldn't be about the money. The, big, the, first, the first consideration should be, do I have the right tenant? to do what I want to have happen to my farm because I want my farm to be better when I'm done with it versus how much money can I get from who? Uh, because the bottom line is we only get to own the farm for just a short period of time in the whole history of world or whatever, the whole history of that land. We only get it for just a few years. And so what's our job? I think our job as landlords is to make it a better place for the next generation so we can continue to have good food production for the, for the growing population of the world, essentially. And so I think that that should be our first consideration. Do we have a tenant out there that's going to do the right thing at the right time and have our place be in a good or better shape than it was before, rather than what's our biggest, what's our biggest, uh, you know, what, what can be our biggest return on our investment, if you will. I think we have to get it done farmed right first and worry about return investment later. Leasing considerations. Um, if, okay, so this is more for probably more for cash rent than anybody else, anything else. But if, if a tenant is helping do a bunch of this stuff, which some of the stuff I consider to be landlord expenses, then the cash rent should be adjusted back. Uh, and you give them credit for doing that work for you. The only, the only thing I would argue with is Eastern Nebraska, there's a, there's a kind of a big tradition to mow the road ditches. That, that third bullet shouldn't be on this slide. That third bullet is just, uh, that's something tenants should just do. Uh, there's, there's no, there should be no consideration for that necessarily. I think that that should just happen. That would be my point there. So um, those are the other things I think about. And if, if, if there's something happening there that the tenant's doing out of the ordinary for that landlord, then I think that the tenant could, it's very appropriate to, to, to have that tenant get a discount on his rent. 
Some other things as Jim talked about or alluded to earlier is that we need to have releases in writing. If you have a verbal or handshake agreement, um, know that the Nebraska Supreme Court is, is, has, uh, has uh, uh, defined that a verbal or handshake agreement starts on um, March 1st each year and goes through February 28th the following year. The Supreme Court also defined that for a handshake or verbal agreement to end that lease, you need to end it by six months prior to March 1st, which is by September 1st, not on September 1st or after September 1st, but by September 1st, before that sometime. You can even do it now. You don't have to wait till August 28th to do it or something like that. You could do it right away. But uh, the, the handshake or verbal releases should be gone. And the reason, the main reason they should be gone is that, is that anybody my age or older knows that their, hand, their word is their bond and their handshake means something. And it, but the younger generation, but but it's not about us. It's not about us anymore because we could be gone tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen. And if we're gone tomorrow and all I have is a handshake or verbal agreement, then what is what does my son know? For instance, my son would probably want to where my or my son-in-law would want to take over working on managing that farm for this year. And if they don't know what the lease provisions are, if I just have a verbal agreement, then that's that's they're not going to be in a very uncomfortable situation. I mean. The story, the story, the true story that I got, somebody, the lady calls me up and says, I have to be the personal representative for my mother. My mother's in the hospital, excuse me, she's in a assisted living, uh, actually a memory care facility, and she has Alzheimer's or memory dementia, and she can no longer answer for herself. I'm the, I'm the personal representative, so I have to go deal with our lease that's on our farm, and I haven't been on the farm for 40 years. I've not been the farmer. We have a neighbor that's always farmed that ground. And I said, and she said, what do I do? I said, I said, well, you go to your lease and you go take that to the farmer and say, okay, let's, let's work on the lease for next year. And she said, that's the problem. My mom always had, a, and my dad always had a handshake agreement with that neighbor and we never had a written lease. And so I would never accuse any farmer of, of uh, trying to do anything immoral, illegal, or take advantage of that situation at all. But how uncomfortable have we made it for that next generation is taking all taking over if we never tell them what the lease is or don't have a written lease so let's please have a written lease let's get this taken care of now the last four bullets on this slide talk about if you have a written lease or you're going to be developing a written lease make sure you have the ending and starting and ending date list was listed um also make sure that you have listed in there when the lease is going to terminate how much notice are you going to give i think six months is pretty nice i think that starting at Starting at around March 1st is perfect. I think this uh, given six months notice prior to that is, is absolutely on board. If you want to start a lease on January 1st, but and you want to give four months notice, that's fine. I have no problem with that. Whatever you agree to is, is the right, right over thing. Holdover means are we going to roll that thing from one year to the next? And I think I think the other thing I think is I think the longer term leases are fine if we, as long as we allow a period of time in there when the lease will be re renegotiated. The thing I worry about is if we're renegotiating at least for next year. It's kind of depend, it kind of depends on who we are and when we want to renegotiate and what the conditions are. In other words, if prices are going up, who wants to renegotiate right away? The tenant does, if on cash rent. And who wants to renegotiate at the last minute? The landlord. If prices are going down, who wants to renegotiate right away? The landlord. Who wants to wait till the right before the lease starts? The tenant. And so I think defining that date's important, especially if you're working with cash leases and figuring out when you're going to get that put together. If you got questions about any of this stuff, make sure you just put in the chat or the Q&A and I'll try and work on that at the end, or Jim and I'll try and do it together. So have a succession plan in place, have good communication. It's key to all the relationships on the farm and ranch. Get, give that emergency, emergency plan aside as a little bit of uh, consideration and uh, get good lease provisions put together. And, and more, most importantly, communicate. That's how to get a hold of me, and it's in your slides and can be downloaded, or or you have the printed copy. I'm very very happy to have you listen in, and uh, thank you very much. I will um, stop sharing. There we go. All right, we're gonna take a quick break, it's like a two minute break, and we're gonna get we're gonna get going again. Does that sound right, Jim? You can unmute yourself and talk talk to me. Jim's not at his computer apparently. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like a like a two minute break or not even that long. Yeah, give me give me uh two, they can stand up and stretch, but I think these slides, based on what we did yesterday, they shouldn't take more than what 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah, do your thing and then we'll answer questions for the rest of the time. Yeah, so we had uh just a handful of questions, good questions that have come in so far. Uh, if you got questions, type them into the review pane. There's been a couple that came in for Alan, 
and um, be sure to take a look at them. And uh, okay, Al, can you hear and see this okay, right? Yeah, I see it great, no problem. All right. Okay, so the final piece today, let's talk a little bit about what we've done. First part, we kind of took a highlight, and I, like I said, these meetings usually go for three hours, and we kind of boiled this down to a format that is attainable given sitting in front of a computer monitor watching these things aren't quite as, um, I don't know, whatever you want to say. It, it's not it's not 100% the same, but still, once again, we are hitting a lot of people across the state. So first part was in current state of real estate. Second part, Alan took a look at what goes into the lease. What do we need to be thinking about? A couple of people asked a few questions. We will get to those in a minute. Third part, when we put in the grant to get the funding to do this outreach, the outreach, the grant helps pay for some of the handouts. It helped pay for some of the mileage, some of the technology we needed for today. We partnered with the Farm Service Agency and um, they gave us a set of slides. The fourth set of slides you'll see on the very front of the slide down here in the bottom center. The fourth set of slides is on USDA lending programs. And I just for the sake of time and to do it justice, I think their YouTube clip does a better job than what I could when I would go over it. The motivation of bringing FSA in is there's a lot of different information out there. And people hear about whether you're a producer, whether you're an operator or an absentee landowner or a landlord, there's a lot of things going on. And what my goal is in the next 10 to 15 minutes is to kind of just give you an overview on the major programs that are going to be impacting farms and ranches across Nebraska here in the next 10 to uh, the next year, roughly. And in, in a nutshell, there's really kind of two different things. The ones I'll be briefly talking on are highlighted in that right, light gray color on the left. In a, in a nutshell, there's really three big things. There's a safety net programs related to crops. There's disaster programs that also influence crops, but also livestock. That's a big thing in our state, especially on the beef side. And then the third thing is a conservation reserve program and the conservation reserve program is one that where you can lease your land out to the USDA for a set period of time for a set rate. The other side of their portfolio deals a little bit more on farm finances related to loans. There are different types of loans. If you or your child or grandchild is looking at buying, purchasing land, obviously land costs a lot. They've expanded some of the limits on what they can do for farm ownership and guarantee loans. Uh, there's different types of loans for youth, um, these microloans, those might relate to, you know, buying some cattle or pigs or doing some crops if you're in high school in 4-H or FFA. There are beginning farmer loans. These beginning farmer loans are for uh, someone that has farmed for less than 10 years or someone that has farmed, filed a 1040F for less than 10 years. Youth loans. Uh, there's limited resource loans, but the one that might be a little bit more pertinent to some people on this call today or the farm storage. So if you're looking at building a grain bin or a some type of a facility to store grain or even hay, I think, there are still very competitive loans out there for those types of products. Those are my comments on the loans. Just be aware if you're interested, definitely reach out, learn out what's out there, what do they have to offer, interest rates and terms associated with it. Let's dive into the left-hand side of the slide for a minute. When we talk about the safety net programs, uh, there's a whole bunch of acronyms they provided on this slide. I highlighted the three red boxes here are what I feel might be the more uh, ones that might be impacting us over the upcoming year. The ARC and PLC program stands for Ag Risk Coverage and Price Loss Coverage. And I put it right below the soybeans there because it's really related to more so to the row crops and small grains of our state. Now the LIP stands for the Livestock Indemnity Program. The LIP program, that relates if you have, uh, say for example, you're calving cows out this time of the year. So you got a uh, hundred stock cows. And with those hundred stock cows, you have a blizzard come up and a bunch of the calves that had recently been born and died because it was an unexpected weather event and you couldn't really prepare well for it. The Livestock Indemnity Program, if you have a certain number of cattle, I think it has to be 20% of your total cattle. So if you have 100 and you had, uh, I think the 20% loss, the first 20%, you have to bear as a producer. But anything above that, that's when this program would step in and help provide some assistance. 
The Livestock Forage Disaster Program, while it's one that we may not hear about when it does start paying out uh, assistance, it's paying out disaster assistance when we're in a drought and it relates to grazing land cattle, okay? Uh, just a little bit of a background here. Safety net programs, traditionally, and there are safety net programs for the dairy people. The dairy people, um, just for the sake of time, we'll just say if you're in that area, I'm sure you're probably already aware of it. ARC and PLC is that program that we go across the state and do meetings about every five years, big group meetings on the outreach topic. Now on the disaster side, some of these programs, you might not hear about them unless something really bad happens to your operation, whether you're a landowner or your tenant, but they help provide financial assistance to recover some of the loss you may be experiencing. On the safety net programs, this is my only slide here, and I've done presentations that have lasted over three and a half hours on these topics. Just know the ARC program, what it actually stands for is right here, agricultural risk coverage. It's a revenue safety net that provides assistance when the county revenue for a crop dips below a certain guarantee. Price loss coverage is associated with your historic base, you may have heard of people talk about the base acres with the property and related to that base acres, you uh, have a payment made if the marketing year average price goes below. Price loss coverage is a replacement for what used to be called the old contracyclical program, the DCP or the CP program. And the egg risk coverage replaced acre, which was back I think in 2000, I don't remember the exact year, somewhere around 2008 to 2012 or 13. Uh, revenue safety net, price safety net. Frankly speaking, some of the things I've seen is might be very hard for either of these programs to trigger this year, especially the PLC. Um, just given where current prices are relative to the guarantees, I don't know if I'd see any potential. The potential that might exist, and I'm not predicting any payments here, is it with the ARC program, if things get really dry, I'm talking like a 30 to 40% yield loss in an area. On the disaster programs, the livestock indemnity program, I've hinted already. If you have a certain number of head of cattle uh, get lost primarily to adverse weather or animals reintroduced by the federal government, um, I don't know if that applies to us quite so much in Nebraska, but if you have adverse weather, so think blizzards, uh, there's been periods of flooding in 2019, LIP provides us, uh, some protection to the livestock owners to help the financial loss of that animal. And it has, you have to lose so many animals before it pays out. You have to have documentation. And documentation can be photos, statement from a local vet or another ag professional like that, you know, documents outlines what the animals were. This does not pay, to my knowledge, it does not pay if you have animals that get out on a public pro roadway and cause an accident and die. That's where you have private insurance. This is more store catastrophic losses related to weather events. Uh, ELAP, as the name implies, it covers a lot of different areas. And I know, I don't know if there's a lot of farm raised fish. I know there's some honeybees in our state, but I don't know about farm raised fish. Uh, ELAP provides assistance for if you are in an area that's in a certain degree of drought, and we have it noted right there. And as an operator, you have to start buying hay. That hay is getting trucked in from another area. There is some assistance available to help cover that trucking, which everyone knows right now, the cost of trucking is going up a lot because of the cost of energy. So be aware that ELAP exists and uh, kind of the new twist if you're a tenant or if you as an operator are dealing with this, be aware that there's some assistance available not to pay for the cost of the hay, but to pay for the transportation associated with it. Emergency conservation programs. Uh, this one hits a little bit more, and I got a photo here of a fence line underwater that you know, probably disrupts it or causes some issues. If uh, you have any natural disaster events, so I think this maybe comes more so with uh, flooding, even maybe possibly with a tornado, uh, it helps con the conservation efforts of restoring the property. So, okay, if you got a property that you had a bunch of debris or sand get washed out on it, you might have some assistance there. 
Um, you know, if you have ditches or terraces you have problems with, maybe some issues there that can help with. The other thing is uh, fence lines. I am fairly sure that they can help pay for some of the damages associated. Not every dollar, but there's some money out there. Uh, once again, if you have anything happen on your property, regardless of the FSA or insurance company paying for it, document, document, document when it's safe. It, whether it's a landlord or a tenant, doesn't matter. You gotta take photos to have proof, whether a photo or even a little video clip with the phone. Most phones can record, you know, 30, 30 second to a few minute clips on your phone, I would guess. Be aware that these are out there. Final program here on the Livestock Forage Disaster Program. This program provides, for, provides protection uh, when you see this map here. This actually comes out of the Drought Mitigation Center at UNL. And if you're in a really bad degree of drought, this program pays money to eligible livestock producers to offset, um, you know, if they have to remove their cattle or whatever, this program provides uh, protection if they have to remove the cattle and they literally don't have anywhere to go with them, so they got to start buying forages, self starting to cover some of those losses. Um, so be aware of that. And with the Conservation Reserve Program, the CRP, this is kind of the final program I'll touch on. This program is available to people still. Um, I know there's been some acres coming out with the higher commodity prices, but it tends to focus on some of this ground, you know, kind of buffer strips or ground that's marginal for whatever reason. Uh, contracts are around 10 to 15 years. And with these contracts, um, they're voluntary. You have to make out an application. There's different types of enrollment. You may have heard of continuous versus annual enrollments. In Nebraska, we got about 1.2 million acres associated with that program. So that's a good thing. We got about 45 million acres in the state overall. And if you have any CRP that's coming out, and you are intended to rent it to any of these categories here. So beginning uh, special, uh, there's some special financial incentives to visit with your FSA. So if you have any CRP that's standing to come out, rent to beginning female or socially disadvantaged producers, uh, be sure that you might have some additional incentives. And with the CRP payment, uh, those USDA cash rental rate maps, they're actually tying the cash rents with those to these, and they're gonna be looking at a soil index from the best to the poorest soils. And from those soils, we're gonna be giving out payments to coerity. Another new program, there's a thing called CRP Grassland. CRP Grassland, you're actually signing up grazing land properties. You can still graze the property, but they either, from what I've heard, they either restrict the stocking rate, so how many pairs you can run out there, or, the period of time during the season when you can graze. Uh, some areas of the state I've heard in the eastern part, they restrict it. Maybe you can't put your cattle out to graze until July or late June. They're trying to protect that vegetation out there during this nesting period for small birds and whatever else that utilize ground during that period of time. So it does exist. Um, you know, as always, this was just a very brief overview. There's a lot of details, and the purpose of this brief presentation was to try to give you just an overview of everything that's out there. I'd highly encourage you, if you do have questions, or you wanna learn more, um, think about reaching out to your local FSA office and uh, see what they can do for you. So, okay, yeah, I have, I'm gonna take the first question and then I'll maybe read the second question and let you respond and we'll just kind of go back and forth if that sounds all right. Fine with me. All right, so let me see here. I am getting this going, okay. So we got a question that came in. At, I'll kind of, we'll try to kind of start from the order of the questions as they came in. And if you have questions and you're hanging on here to stay on and then Alan and I will try to answer these as we're going. So we have a question that came in, it's related to flex leases. How does a variable rent using APH account for a major hail event? Um, for example, the operator pays and receives hail insurance, but a cash rent landowner likely wouldn't be insured and APH will drop. So the thing that we had, the question that we're getting at is when you have, and you know, this isn't a surprising question coming in because hail is a much, I think maybe a little bit more common event the farther west we go. If you are doing a flex lease and you have a hail event, 
this hail event occurs when um, you know you least expect it. And with this hail event, how do we factor that into a flex lease if you're flexing off a of crop revenue or even crop yield? Remember, we said there's that minimum floor price, kind of in a way that the minimum cash rent. And with that minimum cash rent, even if that property gets hailed out, the tenant, if you're doing a flex lease where you have a minimum and a maximum, that flex lease, even if the property gets hailed out, the tenant still has to pay that minimum amount because that was what was agreed upon. And they would have crop insurance to helpfully uh, cover a portion of those losses. You know, when we talked about setting that cash rent, and if you're just on a, I think the second part of the question was, if you're just on a straight uh, cash rental rate and uh, you have a major hail event, how do you deal with that? Well, this gets into a little bit of a sticky wicket. You still have crop insurance. Crop insurance doesn't cover every loss associated with it, but it takes a good degree of the risk out. And that's why I would tell you one reason cash rents are lower in Western Nebraska is yes, there's a difference in the yield, there's also a difference in the risk compared to say Wayne County, Nebraska. So some of that maybe is already getting bitted in. Um, Al, I'm gonna read you this question right here. For crop shares, are any of the costs for harvesting the crop shared between the landlord and the tenant? I'm gonna address that one. Uh, the answer would be typically no. Um, the, the cost of harvesting belongs to the tenant. However, however, every neighborhood's different. And I have heard of a neighborhood in Northwest Missouri, three times now in the last 15 years, I've heard that there's an area in Northwest Missouri across from Rulo, across from Auburn, that, uh, from, that uh, they do charge their landlords for harvesting in a crop share. Uh, I think, I think and by what I've been able to explore or discover is that that is, relates back to the idea that in the 60s when uh, corn, uh, corn combines, their combines got into the corn harvesting business and they do the, the shelling and picking right in the field through a combine that uh, people viewed that as such an extraordinary expense to have the combine to do all that work. That they got the tenants to pay, got the landlord, tenants got the landlords to pay for that shelling so they could harvest the corn right in the field right away instead of putting it up as, as the ear. And so I think that's where it came from. But that's only that one neighborhood. And uh, in all of Nebraska, as far as I know, all harvesting expenses are bear, borne by the tenant. Okay. And uh, another comment that was made, and I, you know, uh, one comment I'll make on crop shares for the people that are still on with us right now. Think of a crop share, if you remember the old Law and Order TV show that used to be on in the 90s and early 2000s, I think it maybe it's back on there again. In the intro to the TV show, they had Old Lady Justice and with the blindfold on. Think of a crop share like a, a balancing act when you see those old scales. What is the landlord contributing? Alan had a really good slide on this. What is the landlord contributing? What is the tenant contributing? In some cases, Alan gave his comment on if the harvesting expenses should be shared or not. You know, if they are not shared, how does that lease look? How much does each party stand to make? Um, maybe this year, you're gonna have to see a landlord start sharing in the fuel expense because of the extreme prices we're seeing of diesel going, I don't know exactly what the price of diesel is, but I'm sure it's over four bucks a gallon right now, four and a half. So, you know, what works for both parties is what can go into the crop share. You gotta give considerations to both and the financial stressors they have. Uh, another comment for you, Al, was on crop shares. It says, I view crop shares as far better in a crop. Um, they like crop shares over a cash lease because you're sharing in the risk. Both parties are sharing in the risk and the rewards and the opportunities and challenges compared to a uh, cash rent, um, where they feel like a uh, cash rent, either the landlord's getting the good end of the stick or the tenant is, depending on what actually happens. Do you see... Do you think that crop shares are more fair than the cash rent? I mean, how do how do you address that, or what would you say? Well, yes, I think I tried to illustrate that when I said that the crop share you do a nice job of following the prices up and a nice job of following the prices down. I, I think I tried to illustrate exactly what the, that that person is referring to, and so I agree with them. I think that I think that uh, the crop share is the most equitable way to 
uh, have a, a, a rent if you're willing if if the land if the landlord is willing to take that risk if they don't want risk then you can go cash rent but then you have to understand that it, under under exceptional price or yield years where there's a whole bunch more income they just get what they get for the cash rent but if you run if you're all in this together and you're willing to take the risk like you said i'm absolutely i agree with you crop share is absolutely the way to go i i think it's I think um. great. And that's exactly, you know, the whole idea behind a flex lease is trying to kind of get at what Alan just explained. You're sharing in the risk and reward, and that's just one way to attempt. And you, you still see some of these old relationships where somebody rents someone else's land and they don't set the cash rent until the fall until they kind of know what happened. And that's rewarding to that. Um, another question that came in during your section, um, any thoughts on or mechanisms for buying out shareholder buyouts? You must have been mentioning some organization and structures of land, and it's a little might be a little bit hard to answer that specific one, Mike. And if you wanted to contact Alan or myself, we might be able to do that. But uh, maybe Al, you can talk a little bit. I guess I'll try to interpret this question. Uh, say you inherited land as a shareholder, maybe in a trust or an LLC, and you got some parties that went out and you want to still own it, can you buy other people out or what do you have to say on it? Yeah, the, 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 that would be precisely my point. I think that that person should email me or maybe give me a phone call um, and, and let's let's discuss that because I don't know what, what mechanism is in place. I don't know if we have an LLC in place, an old C Corp, an old S Corp. I don't know what was going on. And depending on what you have, it's going to matter what the answer is. And quite honestly, I'm not a lawyer. You're asking a lawyer a question, and I'm not a lawyer. So you probably need to get with your own CPA or your own lawyer to, to get the true answer to that question. I'm not trying to duck the question. I'm just saying I may not know the answer because it gets fairly technical fairly quickly, especially from a tax implication standpoint or a legal implication standpoint. So, and I'm not either. I'm not a CPA or a lawyer. So There are ways to handle that. Um, there are just so many different ways to set up that stuff that Alan and I show our limitations and our knowledge and abilities. Yeah, yeah uh, Jim, let me jump. Let me jump in here. Somebody asked: Does Boyd County Office is no longer an F has an FSA? Uh, is it now served by Holt County Office? That is correct. I looked it up on the website uh, on the farm, uh, farmers .gov, farmers gov website, and it says that you could either go to O'Neill or you can go to Spencer. Spencer would be the other place to go. Uh, for your um, work there out of Boyd County. Spencer, would Spencer be, what county is that? That's Boyd Spencer. County. You know, I, it's in Spencer, Nebraska in Boyd County. I, I don't, I know uh, FSA has been kind of shifting around some of the offices with the changes in population across the state. I would say that O'Neill's kind of the, if you're in North Central Nebraska, you're not sure who to call, FSA out of O'Neill is probably a good place. There's, I know they have a fairly robust office. Yeah, call call that O'Neill office before you take off for there. That's for sure. That's what I would say. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, good. Uh, I don't know if we had any other questions asked to us. I kind of went through this as Alan was talking. I know there's been a few other questions and Alan or uh, Ryan took there, there was a participant that raised their hand. And I don't know, uh, Mark, you, you were raised your hand to talk. Let's see here, can we allow you to talk? Mark, I gave you the ability to ask. I unmuted you, so if you unmute yourself, you can actually ask the question. You can type it in the chat. If you got a question you want to visit one-on-one -on -one with us, you just call one of us, too, and we can do it that way, too. That's not a problem. Um, are you seeing any other questions, Alan? No, absolutely not. I think we're in good shape. We can end this early. People are probably tired of sitting anyway. All right. Well, uh, the final piece I'll say is with your handouts today, Mary Jarvie included a little survey and a self-return envelope. No uh, postage required on your end to get it back to us. Uh, if you want to slip it in the mail, that was your cost. Of, that was your ticket for attending, your cost of attending. Let us know what you think. Uh, provide critical feedback that's good, bad, or anything in between. We really appreciate comments. Uh, you know, was this too long? Did we go too fast? We definitely did go faster than we usually do. So um, be sure to return that, provide your honest assessment. We appreciate all forms of feedback. 
If you have a particular topic you want to know more on, we can reach out to one of us and we'll see what we can do for you. Kind of know I'm a little bit more on the number side. Alan is a little bit more on the succession and people side. So take us for what we both answer questions that either one of us can answer. We have different opinions and uh, hopefully you realize there's no perfect uh, no perfect question and an answer for every question that's out there. So Al, did you have anything else you wanted to add or? No, thanks everybody for participating. We appreciate the, the crowd that we had on. And, and if you got, like, like Jim says, if you have questions, make sure you let one of us know. We appreciate it very much. All right. Thanks for joining us and uh, enjoy the windy weekend if you're in Nebraska.